Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The Black Museum. Its affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Light. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. And in between the stories, I bring you some of the best dark, creepy, and horrifying old-time radio shows from what I've collected over the years. If you're new here, welcome to the show! While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents I'm E.G. Marshall. Good to have you with us. Settle down and be comfortable. Lend us not only your ears, but your deepest concentration while we tell you a strange and macabre story. Where do you live? Peoria? Salt Lake City? Buffalo? Memphis? Huh? Where? Springfield? Manchester? Spokane? Hackensack? No. No, you don't live in any of those places, or in any other place that has a name. You live, each one of you, night and day, year after year, in the nameless, hidden places of your own mind. Mr. Z, who ever dreamed up the black room anyway? I have no idea. Somebody must have? There's always been a black room, Mr. K, far as I know. Hell of a place. Yes. How long do you think he'll last? Matter of days. Weeks, possibly. Then what? He'll go mad. Or die. Our mystery drama, The Black Room, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Somewhere in some unspecified place are three men. Three men of no particular distinction and no particular importance except to themselves. Yet the urgency of their speech and the intensity of their attitudes would make you think that something of the gravest consequence is taking place. And for all that I know, it is. Listen now to the story of the Black Room. Why me? Why me? Of all people, I'm a... 
Now, direct from CBS News, this special Radio Net Alert news report. I'm Jim Kilpatrick, CBS News in New York. Former President Nixon remains in critical condition in a hospital in California. The latest medical bulletin was issued moments ago by Norm Nager, a hospital spokesman in Long Beach, California. Former President Richard Nixon remains in critical condition. His vascular system, however, is now stabilized. He has a low-grade temperature. He has a somewhat elevated pulse rate. He is on intravenous feedings and medication. His blood pressure is stable now. He is under care of a team of specialized intensive care nurses. The surgeon, Dr. Alden Hickman, is remaining near him through the night. Mrs. Nixon and his daughter, Julie Nixon Eisenhower, are with him now. We, that is the end of Dr. Lundgren's statement. Barring significant developments in the night, at which point we will alert the press, the next scheduled briefing will probably be about 10 a.m., said somewhere between... Norm Nager, a hospital spokesman in Long Beach, California, with the latest medical information on former President Richard Nixon. I'm Jim Kilpatrick, CBS News. And now back to the CBS Mystery Theater. Take you because we thought you unusual. Well, then, for God's sake, why? We need information. I haven't got any information. We think you have. Information about what? Look, if I have it, I'll give it to you. I'll tell you anything you want to know. You mean that? What do you want to know? Why did you do it? Do what? You know. I don't know. Do what? It's not going to tell us. What am I supposed to know? How could a man like me know anything? Look me in the eye. Step up here. Closer. Look me straight in the eye. Now, why did you do it? I... I didn't do anything. Come on now. He'll never tell you. What am I supposed to have done? He's hopeless. You guys, I... I never saw you before in my life. Who the hell are you, anyway? I'm the man in charge here. And who's he? My deputy. Well, who gave you the right to bust into my house, drag me down here, and start asking me questions? Well, who gave you the right to do that? It's not a question of right. Well, it damn well should be. But it isn't. <sighs> Can I make a phone call? I can make a phone call, can I? I'm afraid not. Well, everybody's allowed to make a phone call. That's what I always heard. I want, I want to call my wife, my, my, my lawyer, somebody. Out of the question. We have no phone. You... I never heard of a place that had no phone. Now you have. But you just can't keep me here. It's not right. What's your idea of what's right? We'd really like to know. Well, I... I can't tell you offhand like that. I don't know exactly. Quite so. Neither do we. Mr. K, I think it's time for the black room. Right. Come with me, please. Come with you where? No, I'm not going anywhere with you. Come on, come on. I don't have yes, to go. Yes, you do. Come on. Do I have to? Yes, you do. Right this way. I don't understand any of this. What is this place you're taking me to? What, what, what did he call it? The black room. Why, why do you call it that? Because it's black. Why, painted black, black walls, black furnishings, what? Well, there aren't any furnishings, it's just a room. And it's black. You're putting me in solitary. You'll be alone. There we are. Step in, please. Well, I... I, I can't see a thing, nothing. It, it, it's black. That's why it's called the black room. Well, switch on the light. There is no light. Once I close this door, there'll be no light of any kind. You can't do this. Get out of my way. No, 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 no just... Help! No. Somebody help! Don't make help. such a fuss. Cut it out. I'm going to close this door. Are you there? Are we, are we both in here? 
Well, say something. Are you here? You haven't any matches on you by any chance? Or a lighter? No. Once I go out that door, you'll be in total darkness and total silence. No light, no noise, no sound of any kind. Only what you make yourself. I don't see why... You'll be fed once a day, never at the same time. How, how, how will I know when? It'll be either before you get hungry or after you stop being hungry. You, you'll bring it to me? You'll find it somewhere on the floor. Well, how will I find it if I can't see it? You'll feel around till you come to it. There'll be bread and water, and once in a while, if I'm in the mood, some cheese or a piece of fruit. Okay. Got it? Um, will you, uh, will you tell the warden something for me? The who? The warden? Well, whoever he is. The keeper. Keeper? Well, you know who I mean. The man in charge. That's Mr. Z. The end of the line. Tell him what? Tell him that I... That you what? I, uh... I've forgotten him. Well, it's a good beginning. Keep it up. Oh, wait a, wait a second, wait. What now? Let me look at the light. Look at it. Okay. That's all. <sighs> to fear. Fear itself. Yes. Why am I whispering? I should be shouting. What's that? I hear something. I, I hear. What is that? It's my heart. It's my heart beating. I'm hearing my own heart. The only thing I can hear is my own heart. My, my... Shh, 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 shh. Quiet, quiet. Quiet down. Quiet, quiet. That's better. Yes. That's better. Much better. Better. Yes. How did it go? Very routine. Good. He fussed a little. Oh? I found it necessary to step inside with him for a few seconds. No trouble, though. He went numb pretty fast. I thought he would. He wanted me to give you a message, but then he couldn't remember what it was. Oh, uh, and he thinks you're some kind of a warden. A warden? Or a keeper. Poor man. You know, Mr. Z, I didn't much like it inside that room. You knew you were coming out. Who ever dreamed up the black room anyway? I've no idea. Somebody must have. There's always been a black room, far as I know. Hell of a place. Yes. How long will he last, do you think? Matter of days. Weeks, possibly. Then what? He'll go mad. Or die. Wonder what he's doing now. Oh, counting by twos, then by threes, then by fours. Anything to keep from thinking. That's what they all do. Remember things. Beautiful things. Remember the ocean, the sand, the sounds of the sea, the waves, winds running on, on the beach. Oh, God, I'm crying. These are my tears. Oh, come on, no, let's not have any of that. None of that. No, just remember other things. The, the house, no. Not, not the house. I'm not ready to think about the house. Oh, school. Oh, yes, school. Oh, uh, uh, Matthew Arnold, English poet, 1822 to 1888. Yeah, something like that anyway. Uh... Is it so small a thing to have enjoyed the sun, to have lived light in the spring, to have lived, to have thought, to have done? To... I don't know the rest. Oh, sleep. I want to sleep. No, no, I'm afraid to sleep. Will I ever sleep? What? 
What's that? I heard something. Yes, I, I hear something. Shh, shh, shh. Quiet, quiet. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, it's a rat. They've let a rat in here. I'm shut up with a rat. Where, where, where is that? Where, where is that rat? I'll kill it. I'll kill it with my bare hands. Where is it? Where is that? Where, where, where? Can't hear it anymore. Where is that rat? Where is it hiding? What'll it do? Ah! Ah! No, that's enough of that. Just... Lie down on the floor. Stretch out. Just let go. What will happen will happen. Just let it happen. That's the best way. Don't fight. Don't struggle. Just lie quiet. Into your mind. Yes. It doesn't matter if my eyes are open or closed. Isn't that funny? They're not really funny. When I go to sleep, will my eyes close or will they stay open? Yes, I can feel my eyelids raise themselves up. Now I feel them come down. But everything's the same. Black, just... Black. It ran over my hand. The rat, the rat ran across my hand. Where, where is it now? I don't hear it. Did I imagine that? Did I ever hear it? Did I really feel it? There, there. I hear it. I hear it again. Now, why would they do that? Why would they put me in a black room with a rat? They must be devils. Where is that rat now? Shh, shh, shh. Wayla makes a noise. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, again. Ran across my hand again. And wait, wait, wait. Just hold on now. Hold on. Hold on, it's not so bad. The rat didn't bite you, did he? No. No, he simply ran across the back of your hand. That's all, you're not hurt. You're perfectly all right, perfect. Oh, you don't sound like such a big rat. Oh, you sound like kind of a very small rat. Oh, you could be a mouse. Sure, a very small little mouse, why not? Now, if I should just lie here quietly with my arms spread out like this, would you run across my hand again, would you? Huh? Hey, you see, I'm, I'm calmer now. I'm much, much more relaxed. I'm waiting. Ah, ah, there you are. Oh, on my fingers. Oh, such light little feet, so delicate. Oh, I think you must be no more than two inches long. How are you, my friend? Huh? How is my mouse chum? My pal, Mr. Mouse. How's everything with you? Okay? Good. Me? Oh, I'm, I'm managing. So far? So far, so good. Yeah. You know, I think I can hold out for a while. Anyway, at least I'm not alone. Not altogether alone. Not quite. The great horror is the fear of being alone. Man will do anything, suffer anything to avoid it and to postpone that crucial moment when, no matter what he does or what he suffers, he must face his own essential aloneness the very last moment of his life. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. The simple man we have chosen to be our hero is confined in the black room, a bare place without light or sound. But by chance or fate or the mercy of God, he has found a companion, a mouse no bigger than his thumb. 
this tiny creature has become his sole defense against the terrors of being alone. Sit here on my hand and let me stroke your head, Mr. Loss. There. You like that? Hmm? Tell me you do. Somehow let me know that you do. You don't know how much it would mean to me to know that I was giving pleasure to, to someone. That's one of the chief horrors of being cut off from everything and everyone. There's no one to serve, to help, to, to amuse. Yes, that sounds strange, I suppose, but I, I never knew till now how important it is to bring pleasure and comfort and amusement into other lives. Will I ever laugh again? That's too much to expect. Yes, I know that. I don't mind crying anymore. I cry a lot. I don't care. When I weep at the hopelessness of it all, I feel somehow it's not quite so hopeless. Now, why is that? Do you know, Mr. Moss? Mice don't cry? Is that what you're saying? Mice take life as it comes. Yes, but men can't do that. Men rebel and struggle and suffer. Oh, yes. Yes, how they suffer. Oh, do you agree with me? Or are you telling me you're hungry? You, you know, when I have for you this time, some cheese. Yes. They left me a piece of cheese this time. I ate most of it, but there are some crumbs. And they're in the breast pocket of my shirt. Now, if you just get into my pocket, way down at the bottom. You're, you're easy, easy now. Don't be frightened. Now, you know I wouldn't do anything to hurt you, my little friend. There. Head first. Down you go. <laughs> ah, yes, you found them. You found the crumbs of cheese. You're, you're eating, and I'm almost laughing. <laughs> Not quite, but almost. I'm almost laughing because you're so pleased. I gave him a piece of cheese this time. What for? Oh, I don't know. Just to give him a little hope, I guess. Well, if you want to drag it out, bread and water get so monotonous. I imagine the last thing in the world that concerns him is monotony. Well, it gets monotonous for me, too. You say he's eating well. So far, every crumb. That won't last. I suppose not. Not if he's like the others, it won't. A few more days... Then. Now stay out of my way, Mr. Moss. Don't get hurt. I'm just looking for our food. Well, maybe he hasn't left it yet. Well, there hasn't been any cheese for a long time. No, I can't count the days anymore, but it's been a long time. Oh, I found it. What is this? It's an apple. Imagine an apple. Say, I wonder. I wonder, is it red or green or yellow? Hmm. Perhaps I could tell by the taste. Hmm. Macintosh. Or have I forgotten the taste of apples? I used to know it so well. You want some, do you? Now, wait till I bite off a piece for you. Wait, you know where it is. Come on, come on, come on now, you know pocket. It's in the pocket. That's, that's it, that's it. I can feel you move against my chest. I think I have never felt anything so comforting. Now, how, how did I get here? How did I come to be living in a soundless, lightless room with a friendly mouse? That's almost, almost laughable, but I've forgotten how to laugh. About it. How did I arrive at this place, these circumstances? For that matter, how did I arrive at, at any of the places, any of the circumstances of my life? I planned, yes. Yes, I made plans. But they never seemed to work out precisely as I planned them. Ah, the marriage. It looked all right, but it wasn't quite what I meant the job. 
Yes, the job seemed to be a good job, but it wasn't quite what I'd expected. The house. It was a good house. A nice house. But not... Not quite... Oh, are you coming out of my pocket now, Mr. Mouse? Have you had enough? Huh? Hey, 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 what are you doing? Are you trying to get inside my shirt? What for? What, what do you want? Oh, oh, I know. To be close to me is that... Ow! Hey, what was that? What did you do? You know, I felt something... Uh, there it is again. Hey, I, I think you're pulling out the hairs on my chest. Is that what you're doing, Mr. Mouse? Ah, yes, 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 you are. Now, why? Why would you do that? Not, not to hurt me. I know you would never hurt me. I, I, are you playing? Are you making up a game trying to divert me from the awfulness? Yes, you're, t you're telling me it could be worse. There, there are things we can do. There is always something. It is never absolutely hope hopeless. Oh, little mouse. You're trying to make me laugh. I gave him an apple today. If you want to play the game that way, I can't stop you. He ate every bit of it. There wasn't a thing left on the plate. No core, nothing. I wonder how he manages to keep up his appetite. Maybe he exercises. After this long, they lose interest. Yes. After all, what's the point? Hope can't last forever. It's got to die. Sooner or later. Oh, this one, it looks as if it's going to be later. Yes. But eventually. What makes him hang on? I wish I knew. I'd give anything to know. It's down here two weeks. Two weeks tomorrow. Should I, uh... Should I go in after him? No, no. Now, wait a while longer. He can't last. You're sure about that? No one ever has. It's only breadcrumbs today. Sorry, Mr. Mars. Hey, where are you? Mars? Mars, I have breadcrumbs for you in my pocket. Where are you? Are you here? Why don't you come when I call you? Now, there's no place to go in this blackness. I can't look for you. I might hurt you. Now, why don't you come when I call you? I have food for... Oh. Oh, what a fool I am. You've gone out of the black room. You've escaped. But where? How? There must be a place. Yes, you haven't always lived in this room. You came in at some point, and now you've gone out. But where? How? There must be a place, a little place, a tiny hole. Yes, a tiny hole big enough for a mouse to get through. No, where? Where? You don't live here all the time. The black room isn't your only home. I mean, not your permanent home. You wouldn't pick a place like this. No mouse would do that. Nobody, nobody would do that. No, no, you came here from somewhere else. You must have. There must be a hole someplace. And you came through that hole, and you've gone out through that hole, and I'm going to find it. What's this? Is this it? Oh, that's so tiny. That's so tiny. Is that a hole? A hole just big enough for a mouse to slip through? Yes, 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 I think it is. Then on the other side, there must... There must be something. The blasted hole is right next to the floor. It's no bigger than my thumb. Or I can't get my face up to it. Yes, 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 I can, I can, I can. I see. I, I, I see a light. I see light, a very little, little light. Oh, thank you. Th thank whatever, whoever you are for this little bit of light. What, what's happening? What's happened to the light? There, there's still a little bit. There's something, something gray, some, something milky, milky gray. What? Ah, oh. ah, oh, it's, it's my mouse. He's... He's on the other side of the hole. I'm looking into the small gray eye of my friend. Oh, Lord, it's too much. <laughs> Who could 
think of such a thing? Who could think that I would be straining at a mouse hole, bent almost double, <laughs> to look into the eyes of my friend, the mouse? <laughs> no, it's too much. It's too much. I can't, I can't comprehend <laughs> what is there to do. I don't understand to do, but laugh. <laughs> He's off his feet. Hardly ate anything the last few days. So, it's starting. What's starting? The decline. I knew it would, sooner or later. I think I'll give him some fruit next time. I really don't know why you want to bother. Maybe some cheese, too. Suit yourself. Look, the idea was never to starve the poor fool. If that was the idea, I wouldn't give him anything at all. He's beginning to starve himself. Can he do that? It's simple. Stay away from food and water. You'll be gone in a few days. No kidding. Animals know that. Well, I never knew it. There's lots of things animals know that men don't know. Especially you. There's a place beyond crying. Yes, there's a, there's a despair too deep for crying. Here, in the dark and the silence, there's nobody. Not a creature is stirring, not even a mouse. <laughs> I can't laugh either. I think my life is closing. What? Oh, oh, you're back. You're back, are you? You're in the pocket of my shirt. Well, I, I have some cheese and, and part of a pear. You'll have to come to me if you want it. No, 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 I can't look for you again. I, I just... I just don't care anymore. I just... don't care. I don't care. Anymore. <laughs> Nobody says it. The drama of life is not in battles or elections or crimes or even in love affairs. The drama of life takes place in the dark, silent soul of every man or woman who has had the luck or the misfortune to live. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago, and now back to the CBS Mystery Theater. I just don't care anymore. These words were spoken by our nameless protagonist a few minutes ago. And I suppose they are the saddest words anyone can utter. I just don't care anymore. The struggle is over. Life is over. When we just don't care anymore. He hasn't eaten anything for two days. Oh? Last thing he ate was that pear that was two days ago. He's starting down the slide. You sound as if you enjoy this. I don't. I think it's terrible, really terrible. It's necessary. I don't see why. I swear I don't. We need the information, don't we? But do we absolutely have to have it? I don't see why. It's the most important information in the world. I just think maybe it's not worth all this. It's worth... All this and more. I don't know why. Look, you're a good fellow. And you're not the stupidest man in the world, or you wouldn't be my deputy. But there are certain things that are, let's say, beyond your comprehension. You agree? I guess so. You guess so? I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure there are certain things that are beyond my comprehension. Just the same... Yes. What were you going to say? How do I know they're not beyond your comprehension, too? I hear you. Oh, I hear you, but I don't care. Even if I did care, I'm not 
not sure I'm strong enough anymore to go looking for you. Now, there must be food all over the room. Why don't you go look for it? I'm sure the faithful Mr. K has been leaving it, and I haven't eaten any for, for, uh, oh, for a long time. So, stir yourself and go look for it. Huh? You want me to bring it to you? Well, that's rough. Those days are over, my friend. I loved you. Do you know that? I really did. I thought you loved me in your own little mousy way, but you didn't. I was just somebody to feed you. That's all. Well, our friendship has come to an end. Mr. Mouse has all things come to an end. He isn't drinking any water either. That's too bad. You feeling sorry for him by any chance? Now, don't start up with me, Kay. It's not like you to go soft. I'm not going soft. It's just... It's just that... Yes? What? I don't know why exactly, but... I had such high hopes for him. That he'd be different somehow. I really had very high hopes for that man. Well... Maybe one day I'll learn... Nobody survives the black room. Absolutely nobody. All right. All right, one more time. One last time I'll look for you. I'll bring you the cheese and the pear. My legacy to you, Mr. Mouse. My last salute, Mr. Moss. Moratory te salutamos. Well, why wouldn't you come to me? You used to come to me. Why did you stop? You knew I needed you. That's why. I needed you more than you needed me. And when that happens, after all, you had a way out of the black room and I didn't. Where, where is that little hole of yours, Mr. Moss? I found it once. Where is that? I'd like to see the light once more before the darkness closes in. Where is the little mouse hole? The... Ah, is this it? Is it? Y- yes. Yes. Oh, I'm much too weak. I can't get my eye to it. I forgot how hard it was. I, I can't... Oh... beautiful light. That little sliver of light. A lovely light. Yes, I'm a little stronger now. I'll find you. Just keep talking, Mr. Mouse. I'll find you. I think I'm nearer. Just keep talking and I'll find you. You you sound very loud. I must be close. Or is it because my hearing has become sharper? Does that happen? Does the hearing become sharper when there's nothing to hear? Ah, yes, you're very near now, very near. I think, I think I can reach out and touch you. Ah, no, no. Oh, no, 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 that didn't happen. I won't believe it. It happened. I won't believe that I reached out my hand and you bit me. I won't believe that. Not that, no. But it's true. Yes, it's true. There's no end to it. There's no end, no end to the shocks and the suffering and the cruelty and the horror. No end to it. When you think you've borne it all, there's more and more and more. How is he? Not eating, not drinking, nothing. Too bad. I think it's time to go in. You think he's alive? I don't know. He could be, I guess. Okay. Go on in. I hate this part. Oh, Mr. K. Yes? If he should be alive, by some chance, and if he should be even remotely in his right mind... Oh, I doubt that, Mr. Z. I know, but if he should be, take him upstairs and let him take a shower. Let him shave... Give him some clean clothes and bring him down here to me. That's it. 
If he's alive and in his right mind. Well, there's always a chance. Why did you bite me? I meant you no harm. Why should you turn on me? Explain that to me. I need to know this one thing before I die. Here, 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 look. Here's what I brought you. See? Three little pieces of cheese. And I'll put them down right here. You know what? Do you know what? I could kill you if I wanted to, but I don't want to. Now, for a little while, you kept me from going mad. And for that, I'm grateful. Yes. So, go on. Go on, bite me if you want to. I won't mind. Go ahead. You're not saying anything, Mr. Mouse. Are you still here? Or did you run away? Did you run to your mouse hole? Did you run through to the other side to live in the light, in the beautiful light? Or are you still here? Hmm? Why don't you say something? What's this? Is that you? Is this your little furry body? Huh? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Wait, no. No. What is that? Oh. Oh, no. Oh, that, that, that can't be. What, one, two, two, three, three, four. Why? Oh, you're not Mr. Mouse at all. You're, you're Mrs. Mouse. You're your mother Mouse. Four, four, five, five baby. Five, five? How many? Oh, Yes, you were afraid I might hurt them. That's why you bit my hand. Yes, yes, I understand. But now you trust me. Not now. Now you know. Oh. Oh, Mother Mouse. My beautiful little Mother Mouse. My dear, dear friend. Do you know I'm crying again? And my tears are falling on you and on your children. <laughs> What, what, what? I came to get you. What? Come on. You can't see your way to the door, can't you? Yes, yes. Well, come on. Nothing like a shave and a shower, am I right? I think you've lost a little weight, a few pounds. Oh, here. I brought you some clean socks. I hope they're the right size. I had to guess. You care to weigh yourself with some scales over there? Oh, thank you. Well, the rations were pretty thin, I know that. Now, how did you like the fruit? What? The fruit I left for you, and the cheese. Did you like it? Very much. I thought you would. Hey, don't put that shirt back on. I brought you a clean one. Here. I think it'll fit. Thank you. Now, give me your old one, and I'll throw it out. Don't touch that shirt. Huh? Keep your hands off that shirt. You want to save it. It's pretty dirty. I want to save it. I'll wash it for you. No, leave it alone. You want it the way it is? Just the way it is. Do you say so? Well, you ready? Yes. Let's go visit Mr. Z. He's dying to talk to you. <laughs> you look rather well. Surprisingly well. Please, sit down. I'm glad to see you. Are you really? Yes, really. Very glad. You've no idea how glad. It's been, let's see, 26 days. That's remarkable. Truly remarkable. Um, tell me something, if you can. How did you do it? How does a man survive 26 days in the black room? Can you tell me? I really want to know. What does a man need to have to come out of there intact? He, he needs... He, he needs to care for some living soul. That's all he needs? He, he needs to care a lot. That's all? Just that? That and a little light. You're very tired, aren't you? Yes. It's been quite an ordeal. Oh, yes. We'd like to give you a complete physical examination before you go, if you don't mind. 
I, I can go? Also a psychiatric testing. And then I can go? One other thing. Oh. And what's that? After we've completed the examinations, would you be so kind, sir, as to address a few words to the membership? Not a long speech. We wouldn't expect that. But if you'd expand a little on what you've told me now, here... Now, wait a moment. What membership? Don't you know? Well, how am I supposed to know? I thought you'd guess. Is, is this a, a club? Some, some kind of a cult? Not precisely a club. Certainly not a cult. Well, then what, what is it? Who are the members? People in trouble. Troubled people. But... But that's practically everybody. Quite so. Yes. Will you talk to them, sir? They'd be ever so grateful. Then... You can go home. Where do you live? Main Street? Lakeshore Drive? Mulberry Lane? Park Place? Lenox Avenue? Corner of 4th and Walnut? Three miles out on Route 7? Come now. You know better than that. You may hang your hat anywhere at all, but you live in the black room of your own mind. I'll be back shortly. Has our little story depressed you? Made you unhappy? I hope not. And if it has, I'm sorry. I'd like to leave you with a piece of gentle advice. As long as you must live in the black room at the center of yourself, get to know it. Know it well. It will frighten you, yes, but it will reward you, too, in ways you would hardly believe. Our cast included Larry Haynes, George Petrie, and Peter Collins. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. What is the whole contract? That while a person owns this dark imp in the bottle, any request that concerns money, gold, or wealth, no matter how unreasonable, will be satisfied. And that to dispose of this creature and its spell, you must sell it for less than your original price. Oh, here. Seven dollars and forty. Five. Five dollars is enough. Okay. Cheap at nearly half the price. Oh, think first, Barry. Think. Remember, it will keep you rich as long as you live. But remember, too, if you do not sell it for less than you paid for it before you die, your soul will surely rot. In hell for eternity. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv.
In 1589, King James VI of Scotland, later James I of England, was due to marry Princess Anne of Denmark. As the princess sailed to Scotland, fierce storms raged and forced her and her company to find shelter in Norway. Although James and Anne were eventually wed, the tempest was blamed on malevolent witches who were said to want to thwart their royal union. Thus, both in Denmark and Scotland, large-scale inquisitions were instigated against suspected sorcerers for two years, with King James himself supervising some of the tortures and examinations that occurred. History would come to remember this inquisition as the North Berwick Witch Trials. They ran for two years and implicated over 70 people. Amongst those said to be witches was Dr. John Fian. Fian, who went by the alias Cunningham, was discovered with the aid of another, Gillis Duncan, who confessed to the authorities that he was a fellow practitioner. At first, Fian said nothing at all. The Inquisitors then began the customary torture, starting with one of their milder punishments, which involved thrashing Fian's head about with a rope around it. After that, he started to talk. Yet he provided no coherent confession that satisfied his tormentors. Thus, a torture method known as the boots, which King James described as the most severe and cruel pain in the world, was employed. Whilst there are many variants of the boots torture to have been used and recorded around the world, they all seem to agree on a singular principle, the inflicting of excruciating pain to the lower legs, either by crushing the bones therein or by searing the flesh off them with boiling water. Still, Fian was resolute. He would not confess to witchcraft. This prompted a further examination of his body where it was found that two pine needles had been placed under his tongue. Supposedly, this was a spell cast to prevent him from confessing under torture. With the needles removed, Fian confessed to everything. He stated that his soul belonged to the devil after having made a covenant with him long ago. It was by serving him that Fian had gained his powers of witchcraft. It was recorded that amongst his powers was the ability to bewitch a gentleman and send him into fits of lunacy. One man who supposedly suffered in this manner was brought before the king's presence on the 24th of December, 1590. What the man allegedly did under Fian's command is described in King James's own book, Daemonology. He said, Suddenly he gave a great screech and fell into a madness, sometimes bending himself and sometimes capering or gesticulating so directly up that his head did touch the ceiling of the chamber to the great admiration of his majesty and others then present. When the man was finally worn out by his supposed bewitchment, it took an hour for him to come to his senses and be brought back before the king, only to admit to having no memory of the event. Fian continued to tell other tales of his nefarious witchcraft, which were verified by witnesses of the court. Supposedly, Fian had attempted to enchant the girl with a spell of seduction. When the spell backfired, after being sabotaged by the girl's mother, who was also a witch, Fian ended up seducing a cow instead. Records state that inhabitants of the town confessed to having seen this cow follow Fian wherever he went. Eventually, Fian promised to recant his evil ways. He testified that the devil had come to visit him the night before with a white wand in his hand, trying to persuade him to keep his vow and serve him. Fian said that he castigated the archfiend, telling him, I utterly forsake thee. The devil then supposedly broke the white wand and said that once ere thou die thou shall be mine. Soon after this, Fian managed to steal the keys from his jailer and escape. His freedom did not last long, for the king's men soon caught up with the supposed malefactor and detained him. John Fian then endured more horrendous tortures. This time, however, he confessed to nothing, even after his feet were completely pulverized. According to records of that time, his nails upon all his fingers were ruined and pulled off with an instrument called in Scottish a turcus, which in England we call a pair of pincers, and under every nail there was thrust in two needles or even up to the heads. At all which torments notwithstanding, the doctor never shrunk any wit, neither would he then confess it to the sooner for all the tortures inflicted upon him. Then was he with all convenient speed by commandment 
convey it again to the torment of the boots, wherein he continued a long time and did abide so many blows in them that his legs were crushed and beaten together as small as might be, and the bones and flesh so bruised that the blood and marrow spouted forth in great abundance, whereby they were made unserviceable forever. And notwithstanding all these egregious pains and cruel torments, he would not confess anything. So deeply had the devil entered into his heart that he utterly denied all that which he had before announced and would say nothing. When the Inquisition felt nothing else could be gained from their examination, Fian was put to death. Later, King James would become more skeptical of the purported abilities of witchcraft. Speaking of witch trials in a letter to his son, Henry, James expressed that whilst he believed some witches existed, many miracles nowadays prove but illusions, and ye may see by this how wary judges should be in trusting accusations. Up next on Weird Darkness is the story of America's most creative serial killer, H. H. Holmes, coming up. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Countdown for a blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. If you wanted to take over our world with a minimum amount of resistance and trouble, how would you go about it? Tonight we'll tell you how, with a strange and chilling story by George Lefferts, The Parade. You are Mr. Sid Ryan. The same. My name is Lucha. I am a Martian. Ah, pleased to meet you, Mr. Lu... Uh, what was that again? A Martian. As in Orson Welles? Precisely. <laughs> I'm a Rotarian myself. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, now that we've had our little joke, Mr. Lucha, what can Publicity Associates do for you? I am interested in obtaining publicity. It has been my observation that advertising and publicity are the very backbone of earthly civilization. Spoken like a true Martian, Mr. Lucha. Now, if you'll tell me the name of the client... The client, of course, will be the Martians. You don't give up, do you? Give up? The gag, I mean. Oliver! Yes, Mr. Ryan? This is Mr. Luchar. Oh, how do you Mr. do... Mr. Luchar claims to be a Martian. 
Take him outside, will you, Oliver? I am happy to see, Mr. Ryan, that my telling you I am a Martian has approximately the effect I guessed it would. I believe we can do business. I have here cash retainer of $5,000. Five thousand... Oliver, take a look at that wad of lettuce. It's the real stuff, Mr. Ryan. And my client is prepared to spend many times that amount. Well, sit down, Mr. Lucha. Oliver, get the client a cigar, the 50-cent box. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, now, what can I do for you, sir? I wish you to manage a publicity campaign. A very large and important campaign. Is the product established, or is it something brand new? Something quite new. Now, what would you judge the most effective type of campaign? Well, if the client has a lot of dough to throw around, a suspense campaign is best. First, you place ads in the paper saying, Watch this space. Then, about a week later, you run an ad saying XYZ or PDQ, and you get people guessing what it means. Then, finally, when you've teased them enough, you bust loose and unveil the product. Excellent. We will conduct a suspense campaign. Of course, in this kind of campaign, secrecy is very important. Once the name of the product leaks out, it spreads like wildfire, and the whole campaign is kafloppo. Quite so, quite so. The utmost secrecy. Ah, uh, you realize, of course, these things cost like crazy. Would, say, one million dollars cover expense? Uh, come again? I said, would one million dollars cover it? Why, well, yes, I am at... You did say, uh, a million. I understood that you have handled some very large accounts. Of course, if this is too big... No, no, not at all, not at all. I, as a matter of fact, I seldom touch anything less. Right, Oliver? Huh? Oh, oh, oh of course, that's right, Mr. Ryan. Absolutely right, <clears throat> yes. You will begin, then, by saturating the newspapers, the radio, the streetcars, with a very simple statement. Uh, what's that? I will write it on a card. Here you are. The Martians are coming. Say, that's not a bad teaser. Got that, Oliver? Yes, sir. The next ad will read, June 1st is Martian Day. June 1st is Martian Day. Uh, what happens on June 1st? The parade takes place. What parade? I wish you to arrange a parade up Fifth Avenue. You mean like the Macy Parade? Exactly. Except that the theme will be the world of tomorrow, the Martian world. My client would like it to be a gay affair. Balloons, clowns, pennants, pretty drum majorettes. Say, that sounds terrific. I might be able to interest the department stores in a tie-in. Fine. The parade will climax the campaign. On June 1st, the product will be unveiled. Good enough. Uh, by the way, Mr. Luchard, just uh, what is the product? Uh, what are we selling? Oh, no, Mr. Ryan. Secrecy? Remember? Yeah, but after all... Mr. I... Ryan, all will be revealed to you in good time. For the moment, let us say that we are selling a concept. A concept? The concept of invasion from Mars. Sorrel Talent Agency... Uh, Sammy Sorrell, please. Uh, this is Sammy. Uh, this is Sid Ryan over at Publicity Associates. Listen, Sammy, how are you fixed for midgets? I got midgets. Fine, I need 40 midgets for a parade. 40, June 1st. And listen, Sammy, I want them dressed in little space suits. In little... Uh, you, you know, like men from Mars. Mars. Okay, and I want some movie extras, uh, maybe 50 of them. 50. Also rigged up like men from Mars. Make them look gruesome, got that? Gruesome. Also, I need some horses with pretty girls on top of them. Yeah. Maybe you can get that bunch from Maroney's Traveling Circus, the one we booked for the Fireman's Parade in Albany last year. Yeah, I'll try, Sid. Never mind the expense. Just get me the talent. It sounds like you landed a big client there. Who is it? <laughs> it's a secret. I got to hang now. Call me back, Sammy. Right. Uh, how you doing, Oliver? Oh, fine, Mr. Ryan. Just fine. I got a hundred small boys pasted in little stickers. The Martians are coming on the subway platform. Good. We got full-page ads in all the dailies. Good. And ten-second spot announcements on every local station. Good. It's costing a fortune. Good. The more it costs, the bigger our percentage. Spend like you were going to the electric chair, Oliver. Yes, sir. How are you making out in the parade? If it comes off, it'll be the biggest thing since Bonham invented the midget. I've got Macy's, Gimbals, and Sacks to contribute floats. Everything is built around the Martian theme, see? Even the horses will have long feelers attached to them. And funny-looking extra legs. It'll be sensational. Well, that sounds fine, only... Uh... Only what? Mr. Ryan, we don't even know what we're selling. Oliver, my boy. Do you think old Sid Ryan has been sitting here spending all this moolah and not 
putting two and two together. You mean you know who Luchar represents? Just by accident, understand? I have learned that Century Pictures is making a big new epic. One of those expensive pictures they make in secret and then spring on the public because they don't want the other studios to get the jump on them. What's the picture? A space opera titled Invasion from Mars. Get it? Oh. Oh, I begin to see. Also, by mere coincidence, it's supposed to have its premiere sometime around June 1st. You follow me? Yes, but... uh... Mr. Ryan, Century has an exclusive contract with New Features Syndicate for all their publicity. Suppose Century Pictures doesn't like the way New Features is handling their stuff. They want to get out of the contract, but New Features says no, so they have to get around the contract. A man named Lucha, client unknown, starts publicizing the Martian invasion. <laughs> Need I go further? Oh, I don't know, Mr. Ryan. Sounds pretty far-fetched to me, but I don't know. That's what I like about you, Oliver. You're so innocent. <laughs> Now, let me talk to Commissioner Patrick, please. Sid Ryan. Hello. Commish, Sid Ryan. Oh. How are you, Ryan? Fine. What is it this time? You want to drop a man off the Empire State Building into a teacup full of water? The answer is no. (laughs) Also, we're not arresting any fan dancers. You know I don't handle fan dancers. I want a permit for a parade. June 1st, 5th Avenue. It's a Sunday. There's no traffic. Now, look, Ryan, Macy's gets a permit. Gimbel's gets a permit. The American Legion gets a permit. The Sons of Aaron march every time Morton Downey sings the Warren and the Green. Oh, don't give me a hard time, Patrick. This is too big. I have the 5th Avenue Merchants Association behind me. (sighs) Okay. Fill out the forms. I'll pass them along to the license commissioner. That's my boy. By the way, what's the occasion for this parade? Oh, don't you read the papers, Patrick? June 1st is Martian Day. How is the campaign going, Mr. Ryan? Like wildfire, Mr. Luchar, like wildfire. Everybody and his brother is going along with the gag. Yesterday, we distributed 50,000 Martian hats to school kids. I got some of the merchants doing World of Tomorrow displays in their windows. Every big novelty manufacturer in town is climbing on the bandwagon. They want to get into the parade with floats, giveaways, anything. Everybody smells a buck to be made. I wouldn't be surprised if the mayor himself declared Martian Day. I've even arranged for Commissioner Patrick to accept a $50,000 check for the policeman's benevolent fund from the man from Mars. Oh, it's terrific, terrific. My blood pressure's up to 200. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I, uh, I understand Century Pictures spent over a million bucks making that space opera. I beg pardon? Oh, come, come, Mr. Lucha. Sid Ryan wasn't born yesterday, you know. I know who our client is, even if you don't admit it. You do? <laughs> Always thinking that's me. Well, as long as you know, let's keep it to ourselves, shall we, Mr. Ryan? As you once remarked, when these things leak out, it destroys the surprise and ruins the effectiveness of the campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ken Daly speaking to you from our portable transmitter atop the reviewing stand for the much-heralded Martian Parade on Fifth Avenue. It's a beautiful sunlit day here in New York, a perfect day for a parade, and the streets are packed with thousands of spectators all eager to find out what this is all about. There's an air of shrill expectancy. Some of the kids and their parents have been camped on the curbstone since early this morning to be sure of ringside seats when the so-called Martians pass by. I've, uh, I've just had word from Saul Brown up at Central Park Mall that the Martians have landed from big pink balloons. And uh, now while we're waiting for the arrival of the parade, we've brought some people up to our microphone to tell you their reactions to this most spectacular of all publicity stunts. That's right, come on. Uh, what's your name, madam? Uh, Miss Ada Shackley. A little louder, please. Miss Ada Shackley. Uh-huh. And where are you from, Mrs. Shackley? Columbus, Ohio. I see. And I, I see you have your family with you, too. Uh, two little curly-headed blonde boys. Uh, are you in New York on vacation? We came for the Shriners Convention with their daddy. Uh, well, uh, what do you think of Martian Day, Mrs. Shackley? Well, it all seems very strange to me, but the boys have been pestering me to watch it, so we've been standing here two hours. I, I can't make head or tail of it. Well, uh, neither can a lot of other people, Mrs. Shackley. 
But judging by the thousands here today, there's a lot of curiosity. Curiosity killed the cat, folks say. <laughs> well, let's hope not. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Shackley. Mr. Ryan. Uh, yeah, well, just, yeah. Uh, Ryan, just right. 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 And uh, this is Mr. Sid Ryan, ladies and gentlemen, the publicity man who's the brains behind the Martian Day stunt. Hello, Sid. Good morning, Kenneth. Uh, easy, easy. Not so close to the mic. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey, Sid, you've certainly lifted the lid this time. Looks like it, doesn't it? Sid, there's been a great deal of speculation as to exactly what all this is leading up to. I've heard some folks say it's a big war bond drive. Uh, others think it's just to stimulate local business. <laughs> and, uh, look, I, I understand in the trade itself, the smart, smart money says you're building for the premiere of Century's forthcoming extravaganza, Invasion from Mars. Now, come clean. Can you tell us what the real story is? Ah, uh, I can. I'd like to, but honestly, I can't. Oh, man of mystery, eh? Are you going to watch the parade from the stand here? No, I can't. I can't stand noise. I'm going out to my office and watch it gumping. <laughs> well, thank you, Sid Ryan. And good luck. And here they come, ladies and gentlemen. The first units of the big Martian parade. Swinging down Fifth Avenue with fanfare, colored streamers, music, confetti, floats, all the traffics of a Mardi Gras. And here in the vanguard is a whole, a whole troop of little midgets in weird-looking pink and blue spacesuits, carrying Lou Goldberg weapons with signs painted on them. Let's see, I, I can read one which says... Atomic Blaster. Another one has a placard reading, We're, uh, we're Martian through Georgia. <laughs> and here come the clowns, laughing and falling all over each other. They're giving free sugar candy to the kids along the way. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is a happy, laughing crowd along Fifth Avenue today. A true reflection of the great sense of humor and good nature that makes America the place it is. This is promised as the climax of the show. Now a great hush has fallen over the crowd. It's quite a sight to see these thousands of people standing here expectantly, hearing only the great regular sigh of their mass breathing. And now here they come, ladies and gentlemen, the Martians, marching in booted, helmeted ranks, row after row of them. Why, this is an impressive sight, ladies and gentlemen, and a rather serious contrast to the rest of the joyous slapstick parade we've witnessed. There are perhaps, oh, 200 tall, broad-chested men dressed in metallic gray spacesuits with thick glass visors drawn across their faces. Each is holding an ominous-looking ray gun at the ready position. They're marching in absolute silence, keeping step perfectly, as though some mute, unspoken command were marking time for them. The, the crowd seems rather grim and serious now. Perhaps they're reminded of the actuality of war and possible invasion. They stand solemnly, silently, watching. Even the children are awed. And now the first ranks of the Martians are moving past us, down Fifth Avenue toward the reviewing stands of the square. No one moves. What's that? What's happening? Oh, there are a woman, a woman, ladies and gentlemen. She dashed out into the street. For what reason, I don't know. She attempted to lift the visor of one of the Martian spacesuits, but just as she reached the Martian, she fell forward in a dead faint. I tell you, I've never felt such mass tension in a crowd as we're experiencing here right now, today. All sorts of rumors have begun filtering back through the audience. There are excited whispers of, she's dead, she fainted, and now an undercurrent of, what? They're really Martians. This is an example of how a single incident can precipitate mass hysteria, ladies and gentlemen. I tell you, it's a mighty reassuring sight to see the blue uniforms of New York's finest spaced every ten feet or so along the avenue. Somehow, I, I can't explain it, this incident has begun to work on what was a moment ago a happy, carefree crowd. And the complexion is changing. Mr. Ryan, did 
Did you see that? A woman fainted. Of course I saw it. What do you suppose she saw? Oliver, old man, did I ever tell you you were too naive for this business? But that young woman ran out into the streets to get a close look at the Martians, and then she screamed and fainted dead away. I'm well aware of that, Oliver, since I paid her 50 bucks to do it. What? The dramatic moment, Oliver, the stock and trade of the good publicity man. Relax. Holy smokes, you sure think of everything. Yeah, for my share of this deal, roughly $100,000, I can afford to think of everything. Uh, shut the window. Don't you want to see the finish? We'll go down to the reviewing stand for the finish. Right now, I want to make a phone call. Uh, by the way, where's Lucha? I haven't seen him. Oh, he'll be around. Boy, those Martians sure look like the real thing. How would you know the real thing if you saw it, Oliver? Oh, gee, I, I don't know. Uh, close the window, Oliver. Oh, yes, Mr. Ryan. Talent agency. Sammy, this is Sid Ryan. Say, listen, Sid, I was going to call you. I'm awful sorry about those Martians. What do you mean, sorry? They're terrific. Now, don't joke, Sid. I mean it. Well, I mean it, too. They're great, great. Are you in the bag? Never felt better. You mean it, don't you? Of course I mean it. What is this? There are Martians in the parade? About 150. Of course, I only ordered 50, but Sid, under the circumstances... Sid. Well, what is it? Sid, don't you know? I couldn't get you a single movie extra. There's a studio strike in New York. I was going to call you, but I figured... Hey, wait a minute. I... Where'd these guys come from if you didn't hire them? I don't know. Uh, maybe Oliver... Oh, hold on. Oliver? Yes, Mr. Ryan? Did you hire those Martians? No, sir, I... Sammy, this is on the level, isn't it? Honest, Sid, I... Okay, Sammy, I'll call you back. What's the matter, Mr. Ryan? I don't know. I just don't know. I've got to locate Lucha. What's Century Pictures number? Mr. Ryan, this is Sunday. Oh, yeah. Well, get me their publicity director, Marty Sanford, at home. Oh, yes, Thanks. Sanford. Uh, Marty, this is Sid Ryan. Oh, hello, Sid. How's the uh, Fine, fine. Uh, listen, Marty, this is dead serious. On the level, get it? What's wrong? I've got to locate Lucha. Uh, Lou who? Lucha, come on now, Marty. This is life and death. The guy you sent over to hire me for the invasion picture. Invasion picture? Invasion from Mars, the space opera. Are you, Batty? Marty. That picture was shelved last month. What? Sure, back in the can. Too expensive and too fantastic. The big shots decided you can't sell a Martian invasion to the American public. And I never heard of a guy named Luke. Mother of heaven. What is it, Mr. Ryan? You look terrible. Well, it's too fantastic. What's too fantastic, Mr. Ryan? Is something wrong? Open that window. I want another look at those Martians. Yes, sir. Look at them. Oliver, you were in the army. Could 150 movie extras learn to march like that and say... 24 hours? Not in 24 days, Mr. Ryan. Not a second's hesitation. Not one out of step. Look at the way they carry those ray guns at the ready. The only other time I've seen troops march like that was in a film of the Nazi storm troops marching through the streets of Paris. See those chests on them? That's pride. Sheer, arrogant pride. Look at those chins. That's contempt. Nobody could act like that. Mr. Ryan! Oliver, get down there. Find that woman who fainted. Her name's Gloria Montex. Get her up here. Make it fast. <laughs> here she is, Mr. Ryan. I, I can't get much sense out of her. Stay away from me. Gloria, it's me, Sid Ryan. Oh, don't kill me. You're a mom. Gloria, settle down. No, you're wearing a mask. Maybe it's me, Sid. And underneath, it's, it's awful. It's all big green eyes and those, those feelings like, like a catfish. Baby, snap out of it. Listen, what happened down there? You ran out and screamed like I told you about the fainting. That wasn't the act. Oh, go away, please. Go away. What'd you see? Oh, no, please. It's too awful. Please, please. Just one question, baby. Inside that helmet, what'd you see? <laughs> You won't get anything out of her, Mr. Ryan. She needs a doctor. Okay, Oliver, I've heard enough anyway. You take care of Gloria here. Get her a drink. Where are you going? To see the commissioner. we got to stop this parade before things begin to happen. Okay, Ryan, what's the beef? Listen, Patrick, I don't know what it is, see, but something's wrong. you got to stop that parade. Uh, I suppose you'd like the riot squad. That would get you a front page spread on every paper in town. Honest, you publicity guys give me a pay. This may be a matter of life and death. Oh, sure, sure. 
Look, Ryan, I've got no time for your cheap publicity gags. I'm a busy Listen, man. Listen, I'm trying to tell you I don't know where these Martians came from, who they are, or anything about them. All I want you to do is stop the parade and make sure they're on the level. Uh-uh, Ryan, I'm wise to your tricks. Now, if you let the sergeant show you, you out... You won't do it, huh? An honest citizen appeals for protection and you refuse it. I most emphatically do. Now beat it. All right, Patrick. I'll go right to the mayor's office. I'll have you busted flatter than a fried egg. Go ahead. I'm sure his honor will be glad to toss you out on that phony nickel-plated skull of yours. <laughs> You heard me, Ryan. You cannot see the mayor. Adolph, please. This isn't a gag. I don't want publicity. All I want to do is maybe prevent something horrible from happening. In case you don't know it, wise guy, something horrible is already happening. A couple hundred little kids are in the hospital with tomaine poisoning from that phony Martian candy you passed out. Or didn't you know? I didn't. We've got to stop that parade. Sure. Sure, you'd like nothing better than to start a panic now. Maybe a few hundred people would get trampled to death. Think of the newspaper space that would get you and your product. I won't stand for this, Adolf. You won't have to, because you're going to get out of here right now. Go on, beat it, get out. You and your publicity stunts make me sick to my stomach. Oliver? Oliver, where are you? Uh... Oliver? Oliver! It is useless what? to scream at him, Mr. Ryan. Your friend is quite dead. Lucha. He wanted to run to the police with some story about a Martian invasion. I found it necessary to restrain him. Restrain him, you stinking murderer. Now, now, Mr. Ryan, collect yourself. After all our planning, it wouldn't do to have everything spoiled, now would it? Lucha, start talking and talk fast, because when you get through, I'm going to take you apart piece by piece. What's this all about? But surely you know, Mr. Ryan, after all, you've been publicizing it for months. Listen, you... Please do not interrupt. You see, before colonizing your planet, we Martians sent advanced scouts to study your habits, your weaknesses. We found that the people on Earth are predominantly conditioned by advertising and publicity, and so... We conceived the idea of treating our entire invasion as a vast publicity stunt. Clever, huh? After all, Mr. Ryan, who would suspect an invader who advertised his invasion in the newspaper, invited the public to his surprise attack, and spent millions publicizing his plans? Holy jumping catfish. You've done very well. Then there was no product. Ah, but there is a product. The product is... Death. What are you trying to do, Lucha? We Martians are a humane people, Mr. Ryan. We do not like to destroy thousands where a few hundred would suffice. In exactly two minutes, our troops will treat the world to a spectacle of death, which will bring the rest of your planet to its knees in horror. Nations will clamor to surrender. Perhaps, Mr. Lucha. But not if I can help it! You... Yes, please. Operator, this is Mr. Ryan. Get me the field telephone on the reviewing stand of the Martian Day Parade. Hurry. Anyone in particular? Just hurry. Reviewing stand, Sergeant Cassidy. Get me Commissioner Patrick. Hello. 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 You'll have to talk loud. I want Commissioner Patrick. Oh. Patrick, Patrick! Oh, wait, wait a minute. Th things are quieting down. Uh, now, what was it you wanted? This is Ryan. I have to talk to the commissioner. It's a matter of life and death. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't talk to him now. The chief Martian is presenting the PBA check to what? him. The Martians are going to fire a salute. Listen, you got to stop him. What? Stop him! I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan. You I... idiot, the words is going... This is the operator. I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan, you've been cut off. I can't seem to get them back. Doesn't matter, operator. Nothing matters now. Tonight... X-1 has brought you The Parade, an original story written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Joseph Curtin as Ryan, Joe DeSantis as Luchar, Alexander Scorby as Daly, Agnes Young as The Woman, Ellen Deming as Gloria, John Thomas as Oliver, Arthur Anderson as Sammy, Wendell Holmes as The Commissioner, and William Keene as Sanford. 
your announcer, Don Pardo. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. Next week, the tables turn. Instead of Martians invading Earth, we bring you a tale of men invading Mars. Ray Bradbury's brilliant short story entitled, Mars is Heaven. Suppose you were a member of the first rocket ship crew to land on Mars, but instead of seeing Martians, you find that you've landed in a town that looks just like home, that all your dead relatives and friends are there to greet you, so that as incredible as it may seem, you think you're really in heaven. That is, you think so, right up to the fatal moment. The moment of X minus one. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. If you're looking for Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find it in the Weird Darkness store. You can search through all the merchandise by clicking on Store at WeirdDarkness.com. Creativity is usually admired by those who experience it, reveling in the joy and artistry a creator puts into his work. But when a serial killer decides to get creative, the only one who feels joy is the killer himself. And thus was the case with H. H. Holmes. Chicago was a chaotic city in the late 19th century undergoing a transformation unlike any other major city at the time. Construction of the 1893 World's Fair, celebrating the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival to the New World, was attracting builders, architects, designers, and tourists from across the country, even the world. Herman Webster Mudgett, now going by the name H. H. Holmes, capitalized on this broader chaos by blending into the city and using the distracted focus of city officials, including the police, to help conceal his ruthless crimes. Although married to Clara Lovering, Holmes met a woman named Myrda in Minneapolis, whom he coaxed into coming to Chicago. They soon married, with Holmes neglecting to tell her that he was already spoken for. Two weeks later, he filed for divorce from Clara. Then he proceeded to buy a house for Myrda about 25 miles away in Wellmet, close enough to visit but far enough to commit his nefarious crimes without interruption. Unlike many serial killers, Holmes seemed to strategize his eventual murder spree with pinpoint efficiency. He purchased a vacant lot across the street from his drugstore, where he envisioned building a grand hotel complete with shops, restaurants, and apartments along with a number of sinister features, such as secret chutes and passages, an airtight walk-in furnace, and hidden chambers in the basement. Holmes hired an assistant named Benjamin Pitizel and started construction, financed largely through fraud and credit. Due to the plenitude of desperate laborers, he hired contractors to work on the building and then refused to pay them once they completed the work. Because of his high rate of turnover, no one knew the entirety of the building's secrets. One macabre element of construction involved a large furnace in the basement, 
ostensibly to manufacture glass. It wasn't until after Holmes's crimes were revealed that the furnace installer recognized that the kiln was perfect for a crematorium, seeing as it produced no odor. When Jackson Park was chosen as the site for the World's Fair, Holmes was set to become not only flush with cash, but also with a steady stream of young female victims. His building, which came to be known as the Murder Castle, was mostly finished by May 1890. Using a series of aliases, Holmes bought furniture and fixtures on credit and never paid most of his creditors, confident that he would avoid prosecution through his exemplary guile and charm. Holmes's plan was to lure as many unwitting victims as possible into the murder castle between 1890 and 1893. Then, after the World's Fair, he would burn the building to the ground to collect the insurance money and destroy whatever evidence remained. To help deflect any future suspicions, Holmes even went so far as to ingratiate himself with officers of the local police precinct. One of the workers Holmes hired was Ned Connor, a pharmacist in Holmes's drugstore. Holmes began paying attention to Ned's wife, Julia, and his sister, Gertrude, and it wasn't long until Holmes instigated an affair with Gertrude. But with no marriage in the picture and the affair eventually discovered, Gertrude fled back to Iowa in shame. She fell ill and died shortly thereafter. Holmes went on to use his good looks and sly charm to seduce Ned's wife, Julia. Around this time, Holmes actually sold Ned his pharmacy. Holmes was likely trying to avoid his debtors by making the sale. Creditors had begun to appear at the pharmacy demanding payment, and now that Ed was the pharmacy's rightful owner, he inherited all of Holmes' unpaid debts. With Julia and Holmes' affair ongoing, her relationship with Ned had grown strained and tumultuous. Ned eventually abandoned Julia and his daughter, Pearl, to Holmes, moving out of town and filing for divorce as well. With Ned out of the picture, Holmes grew less interested in Julia and began to turn his sexual attention elsewhere. Yet when Julia surprised him with an announcement that she was pregnant, Holmes actually agreed to marry her, but with one stipulation, that she allow him to perform an abortion. On Christmas Eve, Holmes subdued Julia with chloroform under the guise of performing an abortion, and then he disposed of his newly betrothed. Holmes also murdered young Pearl. Neighbors asked pointed questions about Julia's welfare, but Holmes put them at ease with assurances that she left suddenly, merely following her sister to Iowa. Vanishings in Chicago at the time were actually commonplace, and with an inept, corrupt police force, no one paid attention unless someone wealthy disappeared. Bodies found were often given to the medical college or the hospital for research and instruction, and skeletons were stripped and sold to doctors, museums, or private collectors. Knowing this, Holmes paid a specialist to turn Julia's cadaver into a cleansed or articulated skeleton, and then sold the skeleton to Hahnemann Medical College in Chicago. Demand for such bodies was high back then, and grave robbing was actually commonplace. So, as usual, no one asked where the body came from. Around this same time, Holmes' assistant, Ben Pitazel, visited Dwight, Illinois, seeking a cure for his alcoholism. There, he met young Emmalina Sagrand and returned to Chicago with such an awestruck description of her that Holmes immediately sent her an invitation to come to Chicago to be his personal secretary. Beautiful 24-year-old Emmalina came to Chicago and quickly found herself ensconced in Holmes' web of seduction and deceit. Holmes told Emmalina that he had claims to an English lordship, and her infatuation with him led her to take him at his word. Even though he was already married, Holmes asked Emmalina to marry him, and she accepted. However, Emmalina soon grew suspicious of Holmes' activities, and she promptly disappeared. Friends and family asked about her, but Holmes responded with a tale that she had married someone and departed. Suspicion simmered, but nothing was ever proven, and her body was never found. A man named Charles Chapel was the articulator of Holmes's misbegotten skeletons. 
Soon after Emelina disappeared, Holmes sent Chapel a female cadaver with the upper body nearly stripped of flesh. Years later, investigators discovered a woman's shoeless footprint imprinted in the enameled door of Holmes's large vault. They speculated that Holmes used acid to speed the departure of oxygen from the vault, acid which Emelina stepped in before placing her feet upon the door, possibly in an effort to kick it open. But none of Holmes' crimes had yet come to light. At the time, the horizon was rosy. His businesses were booming. His wife, Myrda, and daughter Lucy were just far enough away in Wilmette, and the World's Fair, with its tourists ripe for the swindling, was on its way. All he needed now was a secretary. Fortune brought him Minnie Williams, who possessed talents for stenography and typewriting, as well as the perfect blend of need and weakness. Her guardian uncle in Texas had bequeathed her a sizable estate, one and a half to three million in adjusted dollars. Holmes met her in Boston some years before, and Minnie had fallen for him. He wooed her to Chicago on promises of European travel and extravagant life and children. When Minnie arrived, Holmes wasted no time convincing her to transfer the deed to her Texas property to one of her aliases. He married Minnie quickly, although no official record of their union exists in Cook County, Illinois. Minnie's sister Anna, however, was skeptical of Holmes, so Minnie invited her sister to Chicago to dispel her fears about her new brother-in-law. So how did H. H. Holmes handle that? We'll find out up next. There have been monsters among us lurking in the darkest corners of America, preying on children since the first settlers arrived on our shores. They've always been with us, stalking the innocent from the days of the original colonies to the Gilded Age the Depression, and beyond. These monsters are not the stuff of fiction. They are blood-curdlingly real, and they still walk among us, always looking for their next victim. In the chilling book Suffer the Children, Troy Taylor shines a light on the darkest tales of horror and hauntings from American history and presents a terrifying collection of dark crimes perpetrated against our most tender victims, our children. His most disturbing book yet includes nightmarish tales from the 19th century, when the good old days were never good. Like The Monster of the North Wood, The Pocasset Horror, and The Girl in the Cellar, and continues into the modern day with accounts of The Cluxon Woods, America's First School Massacre, Wineville Chicken Coop Murders, Babes of Inglewood, Suzanne Degnan, The Girl Scout Camp Massacre, The Perfect Murder of Bobby Franks, and many more. Be warned, this is not a book for the faint of heart. These are tales containing brutal, agonizing, and terrifying scenes of horror. Suffer the Children, American Horrors, Homicides, and Hauntings, Dead Men Do Tell Tale Series Book 15 by Troy Taylor. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. now for the best in mystery. Tonight on Masters of Mystery, an exciting melodrama entitled Murder in Haste. All I ask is that you forget you ever saw me. I could go to the police. I'll make it worth your while. I'll pay handsomely. And if I say no? Then I'll have no choice but murder. Good evening. This is Don Dowd, your host for Mystery Time. Back again to introduce another in ABC Radio's great Monday through Friday lineup of mystery dramas. Every night at this time, a new and different story. Our drama tonight on Masters of Mystery, presented live from New York, is written by Eleanor Beeson and titled Murder in Haste. 
Not everyone gets a chance for a fresh start, a new identity. When Albert Taylor gets such an opportunity, he feels that Lady Luck has done him a wonderful favor. Until he discovers that it takes more than a change of name to wipe out a guilty past. As Masters of Mystery brings you Murder in Haste. <laughs> lay where she had fallen, close to the fireplace. Her head had struck against the iron and iron. Blood slowly gathered in the pool on the bricks. I called her name. Helen. Helen. She did not answer. I hadn't meant to hurt her badly. But now my wife was dead. <laughs> And Helen was dead, all right. We'd had our last quarrel, and now I'd killed her. It took me only a moment to decide on my course of action. If I called the police, they'd never believe it was an accident. I had to get away. I changed my name. I'd no longer be Elva Taylor. I'd get a fresh start in a new city. I grabbed up my hat and coat, packed a bag, took what money I had, and slipped out of the house. Two hours and twenty minutes later... I was standing on the observation platform of the Limited Express, bound to New York. A nice night, isn't it? Huh? Oh, uh, I, I didn't hear you come out. I'm oh, sorry, I said it was a nice night. I, uh, yeah, yes, yes. I saw you running for the train while we were pulling out. Just made it, didn't you? I, uh, yeah, kind of close. Hmm. Been in Miami long? Um, no, no. Been fishing off the keys just uh, a week or so. I see. Uh, my name's Ricketts. I'm glad to know you. I'm Brown, uh, Richard Brown. Uh-huh. Uh, are you going up to New York, Brown? Uh, yes. Well, uh, I guess I'll be getting in touch. That's a good idea. I'll, uh, go with you. I knew it the minute he opened his mouth. Ricketts was a plainclothes cop, and there could only be one reason why he was interested in me. He, he stayed right behind me as I walked back through the train to my seat. I wondered if he'd even sit down beside me when I got to it. Then, ten feet from my seat, it hit me. My luggage was on the baggage rack over the seat, but my initials on it in, in big letters. E.T. Ricketts was just waiting for me to stop, just waiting for proof I was Albert Taylor. Then he'd make the arrest. But I didn't stop. I kept kept on going. Ah, uh, Brown. Uh, yeah. Isn't this your seat? Why, uh, no. I have a compartment up ahead. Oh, I see. Well, good night, Brown. Good night. Ricketts dropped into a seat and I kept right on going. There was only one place I could go, the club car. At least I could get a drink there and, and try to think. Oh, Barton, the naked on Manhattan Drive. <clears throat> Here's a stool next to me, sir. What? Oh, uh, thanks, thanks. Okay. Going to New York? Yes. Ought to be cold up there this time of year. Lots of snow and all that. Yes, I suppose so. <laughs> you know... I'm as excited as a kid. Haven't seen snow for an age. Matter of fact, I haven't set foot in America for five years. You're ready to be back. I get a kick out of just talking to Americans again. Yes. Uh, I was sitting in my compartment a few minutes ago, thinking... And... You've got a compartment? Uh, yes. Yes, a couple of cars ahead. Well, uh, my name's Brown, Mr. Jameson. Leslie Jameson. Jameson. Oh, no, wait a minute. You're not the mystery writer. <laughs> yeah, afraid I am. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Martin. Well, here's to bigger and better mysteries. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you say you left Buenos Aires? Yes. Planned to anyway, but made a little earlier on account of that nasty business about my assistant. Oh, I see. Probably go back in a year or so. Say, you ever uh, read anything of mine, Mr. Brown? 
can't say I've done much reading in the detective storyline. Mm. Uh, you have a serial running in one of the magazines right now, haven't you? Yes, yes, Murder in Haste. I don't suppose you're reading it. <laughs> I'm sorry. If I'd known I was going to meet the author, I'd have boomed up on it. <laughs> don't apologize, Mr. Bell. Well, how about a nightcap Or we turn in? Well, I'm turning. Well, it's early yet, Jameson. Surely you're not going to give up the ship so soon. Well, I have to confess I'm pretty tired. I've been rattling on about myself all the Oh, there you are. Mm, say, that's beautiful brandy. Mm, I'm better. Well, what'll we drink? Oh, huh? uh, well, uh, you name it. Very well. Here's to crime. A mighty profitable business. To me, I believe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, tell me about your literary agent. You were saying you'd never met him personally? Oh, a uh, Farrell. Oh, yeah, great agent. I've often wondered what he looks like. You've never even been to New York? No, no, never. Oh, well, Mr. Brown's close to midnight. I feel... Uh, uh, Jameson, what about this serial you're running? Maybe you could bring me up to date on it. Tell you all about it tomorrow. Right now, I'm awfully tired. Well, it's early yet. I'll see you here. I hate to be rude, but I'll have to ask you that. Right. Good heavens. What's that? Find yourself. I hope... <laughs> I came to, it was dark. I was lying in a tangle of wreckage all around me. And all around me I could hear shouts and cries, the hiss of steam. But in the tangled mess of steel and wood that had been a Pullman coach, I was miraculously safe. I pulled myself up, lit a match, and saw that Leslie Jameson hadn't been so lucky. He was dead. I couldn't do a thing for him, and the hiss of flames warned me the wreckage was afire. I found where the window had been and managed to crawl out. I was pulling myself through the window when somebody came running up with a flashlight. Uh, just a second. Now, let me help you. Oh, thanks. Here, take my hand. Oh, easy now. Put down for the broken glass. Yeah, well, that's it. Thanks. thanks. You all right? I think so. I'm a little dizzy. Shaken up. Oh, sure, that's natural. Oh, it's you, Brown. Huh? Oh, Ricketts. Yeah. Hey, you're lucky. This coach got the worst of it. Look at that fire. Yeah. Just got out in time. Say, that uh, fellow you were drinking with at the bar, is he still in there? Who? Who? I'm pretty sure he's Albert E. Taylor. Met his wife in Miami. Is he still in there? Why? No, he left a few minutes before the crash. Ah. Well, you uh, better get on up ahead, Brown. I gotta give him a hand here. Can you uh, make it to the crossing? There's a highway restaurant up there. Sure, I'm okay. Thanks. Okay, Brown. Take it easy. <laughs> watching the fire crawl closer. Then as my mind cleared, I saw what an opportunity had been given to me. It was a risk, but I had to take it. I crawled back into the wreckage to Leslie Jameson's body. I took his wallet, his ring, his watch. I left my ring and watch engraved with my initials with him. What was left of him? Then as the flames crawled steadily closer, I found his briefcase and baggage and dragged them out of the wreck. And ten minutes later, with my identity now changed to Leslie Jameson, I staggered into the restaurant at the grade crossing where the derailment had occurred. Kirk, mister, we got a doctor in the back room. Come on, I'll take you in. No, no, no I'm just a little shaken up. I want, I want to get out of here. I thought I could hire a car or get a bus to New York. You were in the wreck? Yes, I was. What's your name? Uh, I'm... I'm Leslie Jameson. Leslie Jameson? Hey, are you the fellow who writes those murder mysteries? Yes, yes, that's right. Well, if that ain't a coincidence. Only last night I made a bet with Frank, that's my boyfriend, as to which one would turn out to be the murderer in that serial you're running in the post. Well, that's very flattering. I, I wonder if you could help me ab uh, about the bus I mean. Well, sure, Mr. Jameson. But how about giving me an advance tip on the murderer, huh? Yeah, which one? Well, I, I don't think it would be fair to tell you. Well, give me a fast cup of coffee, will you, young lady? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Ricketts. Oh, hello. It's pretty rough out there. Three cars smashed up. How do you feel, Brown? Brown? That's Leslie Jameson, the writer. Huh? I thought your name was Brown. Well, of course, I... Well, you know how it is. I... Here's your coffee. Thanks. 
Uh, no, Mr. Brown, I don't know how it is. How is it? Uh, you have to wait see because I didn't want to. Oh, oh yeah, I get it. I've been reading Mr. Jameson's serial in the post. Murder in hate? Had a little bet with my boyfriend on who the murderer is. Well, I can tell you that. I read the last installment last night. Yeah? Yeah. Got it at the newsstand in Miami. Well, we ain't got it here yet. Well, Mr. Jameson, who done it? Well, I, I don't want to spoil the story for you. You ought to finish it. Uh, afraid I won't buy another copy of the magazine, huh? Well, it's a matter of, uh, of ethics, all right? It can't be. Oh, what do you mean, ethics? I know how it ends. Please, Mr. Jameson, I can tell Frank I got it straight from the author's mouth. Ah, oh, come on. What goes, huh? Well, I don't want... Oh, besides, there's a car driving. Perhaps I could hire... Well, that's for me. I'm driving up to New York. Mr. Jameson here wants to get to New York, too. Was that right, Jameson? Why didn't you come with me? Give me a hand with the driving. Come on. Well, I... Well, first, oh, give right. the uh, young lady a break. Tell her who the murderer was. And I'm sorry. It's it's against my principles. Well, it's your business. Come on. Oh, miss. It was the butler. <laughs> You got a hotel space in New York, Jamison? Well, not, uh, not yet. I thought I'd arrange it when I arrived. Ah, you've been away a long time, haven't you? It's probably not a decent room to be had. Oh, is it that bad? Oh, it's worse. I think I might be able to fix you up at the uh, Midbury. I uh, know the manager. Oh, I, 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 I couldn't possibly. Oh, forget it, Jamison. Glad to help you. After all, aren't we both in the same business? <laughs> in a manner of speaking. <laughs> before the manager had tipped off a reporter that I was Leslie Jameson. And as I crossed the lobby, I heard a flashlight bump. The next day, there were pictures of me in all the papers. There was a story on the inside pages of the paper that Albert Taylor wanted for killing his wife in Miami had been identified as one of the dead in the train wreck in Georgia. That should have meant I was safe. But now, five million people had seen my picture as Leslie Jameson. What if one of them had known me down in Miami? I waited with mounting apprehension for the knock on the door that would announce the police. And I wished Helen was back again, alive. Helen would know what to do. She was a domineering woman, but she knew how to make decisions. Then suddenly the phone rang. It was the manager to tell me that Mrs. Jameson was on her way up. My wife. I hadn't even known Jameson was married. I walked up and down, my mind whirling frantically. I had to get away, and then... The door buzzer rang. It rang again. And again. And I had to answer it. There was nothing else I could do. Just a moment. Leslie. Hello. What? What do you Maybe mean? I'd better come in. Well... You're an awfully simple sort, aren't you, mister? Mister, whatever your name is. Well, I suppose I am. How did you expect to get away with it after all the publicity? Where is he? What have you done to him? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Jameson. I could explain. Maybe you'd best. But your husband was killed in that train wreck in Georgia. I... I had reasons for wanting to disappear, so I took his identity. I never meant to keep it. If you'll just... Just what? Look, there's... There's nothing we can do for your husband now. He was killed. You believe that, don't you? I don't know. I'm going to leave town. All, of, all I ask is that you forget you ever saw me. I see. Well, is that all you're going to say? You... What are you going to do? I could go to the police. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I, I can make it worth your while to... to, to, to Stop, wait. Barry. Does, uh... Does anyone know you're here in New York? Hmm, very fortunate. You see, Leslie and I didn't get along. 
matter of fact, we've been separated for some time. He said he was cutting me out of his will. So, with Leslie dead, I don't get anything at all. But, with Leslie alive... Wait a minute. Well, you wouldn't... Why not? He could retire right now and live off his royalties without doing another leg. You mean you... You want me to keep this up? Of course. But don't be ridiculous. There's, there are a dozen reasons why I can't throw this cover in a week. You have his baggage. Yes? I know his signature. I can imitate it perfectly. I know his background like a book. You may as well get used to it, Mr. Jameson. I, I tell you, I won't do it. It's the most fantastic thing I ever heard of. There's a Lieutenant Ricketts down in the lobby. Seemed quite interested in our relationship. If you like, of course, I'll bring him up to date. All right, Mrs. Jameson. <laughs> Albert, darling, just call me Ruth. <laughs> You, this, this can't go on. You're spending money as if, as if you had no self-control at all. Twenty-eight thousand dollars in three months, besides the deposits I made to your account. Here, look at these bills. Look at them. I haven't got a penny. Are you all through? There's your quarterly royalty check due tomorrow. Well, that'll only pay part of the bills. <laughs> it's not paying any of them, darling. It's going into my account. I see. And maybe you'll have some clever way of getting out from under these bills. That's your worry, dear. Not mine. Five. Seventeen. Fourteen. Thirty-two. Having trouble? Oh, nothing important. Just that my account's overdrawn by five thousand dollars. Well, of course, you could finish your book. Dear. Sure, finish the book. Write a Leslie Jameson mystery. Well, then I suppose you'll have to think of something else. Ruth, be honest with me. How long do you intend to carry this on? Why, indefinitely, be. There's to be no end. There is, if you want one. There's always the police. You could have been decent about it. Instead of spending money so, so irrationally. There could have been plenty without bleeding me to death. I think I've been quite fair with you. You've got kept your freedom. 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 Six months now. No sleep for worrying. Can't eat. Can't. This isn't Counted by a worry. Night and day. Trying to dodge my own shadow. Afraid all the time. An irrational woman spending money as if she were insane. Holding a dagger over my head. Get hold of yourself. And now there's no way out. Trapped. Run into a corner. No way to turn. No end in sight. Nothing to do but go on and on until I break them. Unless... Help me. Unless... But what are you doing? Stay away from me! Yes, sir? You're... You're the desk sergeant? That's right. What can I do for you? You, you, you can take down the statement. I, I... What's the matter, mister? I've, 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 I've just killed my wife.
time in months I can relax. Sure, take it easy, Mr. Jameson. We'll take care of you. Aren't you, aren't you going over there and find it? We've been there. Found it an hour after you did it. Been looking for you all night. You may as well know she's not my wife. Yeah, 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 we know, Mr. Jameson. She was your assistant in Buenos Aires. What? You say she was shaking you down. What did she have on you, huh? My assistant? What is Iris? Yeah, that's right. Your assistant. Have you, uh, have you had a lapse of memory or something, Jameson? The assistant? I remember now. Now tell me, Jameson. What was she threatening to take you to the police? Huh? Okay. But a three-year-old would have known it was a bluff. That's the last thing in the world she would have done. You don't know her. She wasn't rational. She would have done anything. Not if it meant her neck, pal. What? What's happened to your memory, James? It was all over Buenos Aires six months ago. Every newspaper. She's wandered down there for murder. <laughs> This is Don Dowd again, your host for Mystery Time. You have just heard Masters of Mystery live from New York. Tonight's play, Murder in Haste, was written by Eleanor Beeson and produced by Martin Andrews in association with Ronald Dawson and Robert Arthur. Featured in tonight's drama were Richard Janiver, Ralph Bell, Ivor Francis, and Connie Lemke. Next Wednesday, and every Wednesday night, another presentation of Masters of Mystery. Tomorrow night, Mystery Time brings you Mystery Classics, presenting a steering story by Ed Adamson with the eerie title, Death Watch. This is Don Dowd, your host for Mystery Time. See you tomorrow night. This program came to you live from New York. This is the ABC Radio Network. I'm a man of habits. Okay, truth be told, my bride says I'm boring. I like the same stuff, and that's what I stick with, and that includes what I eat. Even for breakfast, I used to opt for leftover pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Uh, did, did I mention pizza? Anyway, now that I'm trying to lose weight and cut back on the carbs, I've had to make changes for breakfast. Now, instead of a big, heavy breakfast, I just grab one of my Built Bars, the best-tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bars satisfy my hunger with up to 19 grams of protein and also satisfy my sugar craving, despite being less than 3 grams of sugar. And at only about 150 calories per bar, if I'm really hungry in the morning, I can grab two of them and still feel good about it. Try replacing your dessert, or even a meal like breakfast, with a Built Bar. You won't even know it's not really a candy bar. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built and build a box of your own. Use the promo code Weird Darkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash built promo code Weird Darkness. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Well, when we left H.H. Holmes, he had just married, quote-unquote, Minnie very quickly. There's no official record of their union in Cook County, Illinois, but apparently they did. And then Minnie's sister, Anna, she was kind of skeptical of Holmes. She I wonder why. So Minnie invited her sister to Chicago to dispel her fears about her new brother-in-law. Guests were flowing into Holmes's World Fair Hotel, and the arrival of so many beautiful young female guests put Minnie into a jealous tailspin. Holmes rented a flat for her some distance from the hotel so he could operate in peace. No one seemed to notice when guests began to disappear. A waitress, a stenographer, and a hotel guest all disappeared from Holmes' hotel. 
Inside, the smells of various chemicals filled the air. Loved ones of the missing people asked questions, but Holmes' answers were always extremely helpful and concerned. To Holmes, people were objects to be acquired. He enjoyed the possession of his victims, the utter control. He gassed them in their rooms or snuck in and subdued them with chloroform. He disposed of them via Chapel's articulation skills or his basement furnace or buried them in quick lime filled pits. In mid-June, Minnie's sister Anna arrived for her visit. Anna was quickly entranced by Holmes and Chicago. The exotic grandeur of the World's Fair left Anna dumbstruck with awe. Holmes gallantly invited her to stay for the summer, cementing Anna's good opinion of her new brother-in-law. Anna wrote excitedly to her aunt in Texas that Holmes was going to take the sisters on a world tour. Before departing, however, Holmes invited Anna on a tour of his hotel, alone. During that special tour, Holmes murdered Anna in his gas-filled vault. To cover up her disappearance, he invited Minnie with him to the hotel to meet Anna and disposed of her there as well. He gave their clothes to Ben Pitizel's wife, Carrie, and at least one of their remains was given to Charles Chapel for scientific disposal. At this point, Holmes began to realize that his many debts and the questions of victims' families were growing too intense for him to remain in Chicago. He set fire to his hotel, as planned, but the damage was minimal. Holmes filed an insurance claim anyway, but investigators suspected him of arson. They required payment in person to the beneficiary, which happened to be one of Holmes's many aliases, so he never collected the settlement. Holmes's creditors ambushed him with threats of legal action and jail. He fled the city for Texas, where he planned to stake his claim to Minnie's land and further enrich himself. He left Chicago with his new fiance Georgiana Yoke, and his associate, Ben Pitizel. Before departing, however, he took out a life insurance policy on Pitizel. In 1895, authorities compiled a list of the missing hundreds of people who went to see the fair and were never heard from again. In June 1895, Detective Frank Geyer of the Philadelphia Police Force was assigned to find three of the missing children, the offspring of Pitizel. They had last been seen in the company of a suspect incarcerated in Moyamensing Prison, a man named Mudgett, who went by the alias H. H. Holmes. An insurance company had engaged the Pinkerton Detective Agency to search for Holmes, suspecting him of swindling the company by faking the death of Pitizel. The Pinkertons caught up with him in Boston and had him arrested. He was then extradited to Philadelphia to await trial for insurance fraud. It soon became clear that Holmes did not fake Pitizel's death at all, but rather killed him and made it look like an accident. Detective Geyer began his investigation by interviewing Holmes in prison, who claimed the children were traveling in the care of one Minnie Williams, en route to where their father was hiding. From a collection of letters taken from Holmes after his arrest, Geyer pieced together what actually happened. Since Pitizel's wife, Carrie, thought they really had faked her husband's death, Holmes convinced her to let him take three of the Pitizel children to see their father in hiding. Instead, Holmes traveled with Alice, Nellie, and Howard Pitizel, enjoying his control over them. The girls wrote many letters to their mother, none of which Holmes actually posted. Months later, Carrie was crushed by anxiety and grief over the fate of her children. Using the girls' letters to help in his detective work, Gary retraced Holmes' footsteps with the Pitizel children, starting in Cincinnati. From hotel to rental houses, city to city, Geyer doggedly traced the children's path to Indianapolis. Here, young Howard became troublesome, and it was here that Holmes disposed of him. Throughout his search, Geyer maintained hope that he might find the children alive. He simply could not fathom how anyone would kill three helpless children. He believed evil had boundaries. From Indianapolis to Chicago to Detroit, Geyer followed leads. In Detroit, he discovered that Holmes had brought Carrie and her remaining two children and kept them housed separately 
just a few blocks from each other. In addition, he had a separate hotel for himself and Georgiana Yoke. It was all a game for Holmes, and he reveled in the possession of his pawns. But here in Detroit, Alice wrote in her unsent letters, Howard is not with us now. As Geyer peeled away the layers of Holmes's crimes, he gained a feel for the man's lies and behavior, even as he was stricken by the children's tragic plight, who, homesick and forlorn, were writing the letters to their mother without knowing she was only three blocks away. By this time, Geyer's search had made the papers, and he became somewhat of a folk hero and celebrity. Readers nationwide followed his search for the missing children, including Holmes. Geyer's search led him to Toronto, where a tip had come in about a man matching Holmes's description who'd rented a house and once borrowed a shovel. With an associate detective, Geyer visited the address, borrowed the same shovel from the neighbor, and excavated the house's cellar, where he found the bodies of Alice and Nellie Pitizel. In Philadelphia's Boyamensing prison, Knowing that he would soon stand trial, Holmes began writing his memoir, a florid, narcissistic amalgam of slim fact and often outright fabrication. It's unknown whether he was delusional or simply a pathological liar. He even wrote a letter to Carrie telling her that her children were alive and well with Minnie Williams in London. When Holmes was confronted with the new development regarding the discovery of the Pitizel children, he maintained his innocence. Holmes plotted to have his memoir published to sway public opinion on his behalf. Geyer, meanwhile, returned to Indianapolis to continue his search for Howard Pitizel. Chicago police, prompted by Geyer's discovery of the missing girls, entered Holmes' castle in search of evidence and quickly turned up a wealth of it. Bones, a blood-stained dissection table, surgical tools, quicklime and acid, charred women's shoes and tattered clothing, human hair plugging a stovepipe, more and more human remains, and the walk-in vault with a woman's footprint etched into the door. Their searches also uncovered the remains of a child. Geyer traveled to Chicago only to discover that it was the body of a little girl, thought to be Pearl Connor, a name that meant nothing to Geyer. In all, Geyer and his associates investigated over 900 leads. Finally, on a last desperate hunch, he stopped at a real estate office in Irvington, Illinois, on the chance that Holmes might have used it to rent a property. Lo and behold, he had. In the rental house, Holmes had installed a large wood stove. Inside the stove and flue, Geyer found human remains. Among other items, he also found Howard's favorite toy a tin man that his father had bought for his son at the Chicago World's Fair. With the discovery of the final missing Pitizel child, Frank Geyer became America's Sherlock Holmes. On August 19, 1895, Holmes's murder castle burnt to the ground. Police suspected arson, an attempt to cover up the building's remaining secrets. On September 12, 1895, Holmes was indicted in Philadelphia for the murder of Ben Pitizel. Indianapolis police indicted him for the murder of Howard Pitizel, and Toronto police for the murders of Nellie and Alice. Holmes's memoir, wherein he maintained his innocence, hit newsstands shortly thereafter. Chicago was humiliated in the national media. No one could understand how the police department could fail to notice Holmes's tremendous number of crimes. One of the most difficult revelations was that the Chicago police chief, during his previous career as an attorney, had actually represented Holmes in several commercial lawsuits. The Chicago Times Herald said of Holmes, he is a prodigy of wickedness, a human demon, a being so unthinkable that no novelist would dare to invent such a character. The story, too, tends to illustrate the end of a century. Holmes stood trial for Benjamin Pitizel's death in late 1895. The Philadelphia district attorney called him the most dangerous man in the world. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. As he awaited execution, he confessed to 27 more murders, but his confession was a mixture of truth and lies. Some of the victims he named were actually still alive. 
His exact murder count will never be known, but some estimates range as high as 200. Holmes was hanged in May 1896. In 2017, two of Holmes' great-grandchildren successfully petitioned to have his remains exhumed in order to finally put to rest a rumor that Holmes had somehow escaped the gallows and that someone else was buried in his place. Such was the power of Holmes's mystique. Many refused to believe that the infamous White City Devil had actually paid for his treacherous crimes. More than a hundred years later, Holmes is still the most prominent example of an evil doctor who gave himself license to kill. But there have been many more, including Michael Swango, who was arrested in 1997 for at least four murders. In Swango's possession at the time, a notebook with quotes from books about killer doctors, including Dr. Henry Howard Holmes. You would think that would be enough of H. H. Holmes, but is it possible that Holmes, America's most prolific serial killer, might also have traveled to England and became known as the infamous Jack the Ripper? We'll explore that possibility when Weird Darkness returns. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Appointment with fear. This is your storyteller, the man in black. Here again to bring you another story in our series, Appointment with Fear. Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Pit and the Pendulum, adapted for broadcasting by John Dixon Carr. Sean Delbury. Captain Jean Delbre. Good fathers, gentlemen. We hear you, my son. I have been confined for many months in a dungeon. I have been tormented by nightmares. Of conscience, one trusts. Pray silence, Fry told you. Even now I have no knowledge of where I am or to whom I may be speaking. You are speaking to me, my son. I am Fra Pedro Despila, prior of the Dominicans of Segovia and Grand Inquisitor for all Spain. Is this the court of the Inquisition? It is. Then God help me. He will help you, my son, if you trust him. But I am a French officer. That is true. A soldier and creature of the Archfiend Napoleon Bonaparte. But a French officer, nonetheless. A prisoner of war. By what right do you try me in this court? Let the clerk read the charges against this prisoner. Pray silence while the clerk reads the charges. The charges against the prisoner are as follows. Im primis that he is one Jean d'Albret, a captain of artillery in the army of Bonaparte, so-called emperor of the French. This means nothing. As the prisoner says, it is no crime. Proceed. 
Item that on the fourth day of September in the year of our Lord, 1808, the said Jean d'Albret did wed espouse and marry that most noble lady, the Donna Beatrice Valdez, niece and ward of the illustrious... One moment. Your Excellency spoke. Fra Antonio, was any cheat employed to trap this girl into marriage against her will? No. We have no actual evidence of any cheat. Was the girl of age? I believe so. Then wherefore is the prisoner here? This marriage was a deplorable thing, if you like. Bonaparte himself is almost at the gates of Madrid. His general La Salle menaces our city of Toledo itself. But lawful marriage, however regrettable, is no sin or crime. There are other matters in the indictment, I think. Then continue. But give us nothing that is not material. Item that on the 12th of October, 1808, the said Jean d'Albret, being in command of a five-gun battery of light artillery, did direct the fire of his guns against the Holy Church of St. Martha the Innocent. <laughs> and thereby of his wicked malice destroyed the church utterly. Captain d'Albret, is this charge true? Yes, you admit it. Good father, hear what I have to say. The church blew up, I think. Would you boast of your sin, young man? It blew up because it was stored with kegs of gunpowder for your army. I had every right to fire on it. And that is all the defense you have to make. I tell you I had every right to fire on it by military law. Is military law above God's law? I don't know. I did my duty. Long live the emperor. Captain Dalbray, hear the sentence of this court. Had your offense been any except this, the holy office would have been merciful. Mark what I say. No man, however great his heresy, is ever condemned to be burnt in the fire. The fire. The fire. The fire. If he first recant and acknowledge the error of his ways. But for you, Jean Delbray, there can be no mercy. No pity, no atonement. The only sentence of this court can be... Death. 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 The secular or government arm to which we must release you has devised two ways of punishment in cases such as yours. You hear the tolling of bells? I hear them. It is the procession of the condemned going to the auto de la fe. Soon, the yellow light of the flames will stream through the windows and flicker on floor and ceiling. Nunc et in hora mortis in manus tuas, Domine. Most of those condemned out of mercy will be strangled before they are burned. It cannot be so with you, Jean d'Albret. You must die in one of two ways. Either with the direst of physical agony. A slow fire of green wood. Iced bandages about the head and heart. So that the fire does not approach too quickly. Be silent, Fra Antonio. I cry your pardon, Grand Inquisitor. Or else, Jean d'Albret, you must die in a certain other way. Have done with this. Pass your sentence and let me go. The law does not permit me to tell you now what. This other way is. It must approach you slowly and force itself into your mind. It must stalk you like a tiger. It must bring you face to face at last with the king of terrors. The sentence of this court, therefore... I had swooned, yet still I will not say that all of consciousness was lost. In the deepest slumber, no. In delirium, no. In a swoon, no. In death, no. Even in the grave, all is not lost. There are shadows of memory which tell me indistinctly of tall figures that lifted me and bore me in silence, down, down, still down until a hideous dizziness oppressed me at that descent into the earth. There was a vague horror at my heart because of that heart's unnatural stillness. 
Then this consciousness swam back to my wits again. Darkness. A stone floor. And darkness. Oh, Beatrice. Oh, my wife. Did you call me, Jean? Beatrice, was that you who spoke? Yes, Jean. You, here, in the dungeons of the Inquisition? I am not really speaking to you, my poor Jean. I am only in your imagination. Am I mad, then? No, but your brain is fevered. You only think you hear me. I hear you clearly. As clearly as I once heard you. In the little church near the Ebro, where we were married. Yes, I destroyed that church, Beatrice. I had to. It was my commanding officer's order. I know, Jean. Be comforted, there are those who care. It is completely dark. There's hardly any air. I dread to get up, and I dread to stretch out my hand. <gasps> Suppose they have buried me alive. <laughs> Courage. Can you stand up? I think so. Then walk. Walk as far as you can. Measure the limit of the cell. If this is not a tomb. You're right, Beatrice. As always, I'll try. Are you on your feet? Yes. Now pray for a poor devil who always meant well. One pace. Two. Three. Four. You are very weak, Jean. Rest a moment. Where are you now, Beatrice? In the flesh, I mean. You know that, Jean. In the old house by the olive grove. Scorned of my people. Yes, I know it. Each morning I climb to the hilltop and watch... Go on. Sometimes I think I hear gun wheels rumble in the hills and long moving columns with the red dust rising about them. Go on. First come the heavy cavalry in plume-crested helmets, on their flanks wheeling like hawks, light hussars in blue and scarlet, and behind them in a glitter of bayonets as vast as light points in the sea, rank upon rank, the long grey coats and tall bearskin caps of... The old guard and the grand army! It is only a vision, my dear one. They do not come. Will they ever come, Beatrice? I cannot tell. Then I must face what has been prepared for me. Beatrice. Yes, John? I tried to walk. I took some steps. Four steps, yes. But in which direction? I can't remember. Are you facing in the same way? I don't know, perhaps. Then walk again. Try. Keep your hand in front of you. This robe impedes me, and the floor is treacherous with slime, but I'll try. Four paces. Five. Six. Seven. It can't be a tomb. Eight. Nine. Look out! I'm, I'm all right. I fell on my face. The robe tripped me. But what is it? My hand is in front of me, lower than my face. But I feel nothing. Nothing, Jean? It's a pit. A circular pit. And I fell on the very edge of it. They would have made you walk into it. Yes. There's a loose fragment of rock just inside the edge. If only I can dislodge it. Listen. Water. There's something down there. Rats, it may be. Rats, yes, but... something else. I heard it move. So did I. Accident saved me. They would have had me plunge there symbolically, like the descent of the soul, to keep company with something else. 
And quick death forms no part of their plan. What is in the pit, John? I can't say. Did you say I was saved, Beatrice? Saved? From the Inquisition? My torture has been merely... postponed. A deep sleep fell upon me. A sleep like that of death. How long it lasted, I know not. But when I opened my eyes once again, I could see. Yes, see. My prison was large and lofty. Its walls formed of massive iron plates bolted or joined together. A wild, sulfurous luster, I could not trace its origin, lit up the dungeon and the circular pit. And the crudely daubed skeleton figures painted in evil colors on the iron walls. Skeleton figures, demon fillers, gargoyle figures. Their colors a little blurred, as from the effects of the damp. And I... I now lay on my back, and at full length on a low framework of wood. To this framework I was securely bound by a long fastening resembling a surgical bandage. Bound. But why? 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 Beatrice. Look. Where? At the ceiling of the room. Thirty. Forty feet up. What do you see? I see... painted on the ceiling... a figure of Father Time. Anything else? But Father Time carries no size. He carried instead what looks like a, a gigantic pendulum from an ancient clock. About one thing I swear I am in my right senses. I saw that pendulum move. A painting cannot move. Yet I swear the pendulum did. It swung a little back and forth, just like a real pendulum. Try not to trouble your brain. Father Time is not like those other paintings daubed on the walls, the imps and devils and skeletons. That pendulum is real. It... Beatrice, take care! Take care of what? You are not looking at the pendulum now. Take care of the rats! The rats on the pit! I see them. They're swarming out in dozens. You can see their eyes glitter. What are the rat across the hem of your dress? Did it, John? What do they want? They have caught the scent of the meat in the dish beside but you. But they'll not get it. Scat, you vermin! Move your hand above the plate, John. Move. Beatrice, where are you going? I can hardly hear you. You are sending me away, John. I sending you away? My poor loved one. You can't bear to see the rats running about my feet, can you? Even when you know I'm not here. Beatrice! It is true, Jean. You are sending me. Yes, it's true. In a cell swarming with vermin, there are others I had rather see here. I had rather see. If you call me Captain Dalbray, then in spirit I am here. Who are you? Don't you recognize me? No. I am that second inquisitor. Fra and Tony, who uh, fought unfair at your trial. Uh, but we were not unfair. We administer the law. That is all. Go. I command you. Go. Not until I have first told you what you already guessed. Which is? As the Grand Inquisitor said, there are two forms of death for such as you. One, death with its direst physical torture. The other, death with its direst mental torture. And I have been condemned to the second? And your guess is good. Listen. Do you hear anything? Yes. I hear something. Turn your eyes upwards. Look at the ceiling. The pendulum. Aye, the pendulum. It has 
descended. Only a foot or so as yet. As you notice, it is not really a pendulum. No? No. Its underside is a crescent formed of sharp, of razor-sharp steel. You mean... A ponderous weight, Captain Dalbray. Its movement is slow now, but soon it will take on momentum. It will swing wider and wider, 30 feet perhaps. Presently, as it swings, you will hear it hiss. And with each broad movement, it will creep a trifle lower. The steel is directly above me. Yes. Above the region of your heart, lie still and look up at it. How long before? You need have no immediate fear. It will not be too soon. But how soon? Who can tell? In the name of pity, give me some answer. Hours, perhaps days. Oh. Its motion can be arrested while you sleep. It's beginning to swing wider. I can't take my eyes from it. Its glitter fascinates you. See how it shines in that wild light. And this is your utmost refinement in cruelty? The law, Captain Dalbray, is never cruel. And now, still in spirit, I leave you to your meditation. <laughs> Minutes, hours, days, down, steadily down it crept. Days passed, it might have been many days, before it swept so closely as to fan me with its acrid breath. The odor of the sharp steel forced itself into my nostrils. To the right, to the left... Far and wide, with the shriek of a damned spirit, to my heart, with the stealthy pace of a tiger. Down, certainly relentlessly down, I prayed. I wearied heaven with my prayer for its more speedy descent. I grew frantically mad and struggled to force myself up against that swinging, glittering death of no avail. Down, still unceasingly, still inevitably down. The sharp steel flashed past within three inches of my chest. And then, only then! I heard you calling, Jean. I am here. <laughs> here is a strange thing, Beatrice. I am quite calm. You are resigned, then? No. That is a strange thing, too. Even now, I am not resigned. Is there no way out? How can there be ten, twelve more vibrations and it will fray the surge of my robe? Only lightly, as a razor in a delicate hand. There will be many sweeps before it bites deep. I can't escape it. And yet... And yet? Ah, if I could only use my wits. You kept me away from you, Jean. You locked me out of your thoughts. If I am here only in your thoughts... Why should I fear the rats? The rats? You open your eyes and your eyes blaze. What is it? The rats! Do they still swarm here? Across the floor and over the meat platter. They have taken nearly all your food. Yes, yes, they are ravenous. And they have sharp teeth. Well? The meat is oily and spiced. If I take what remains of it, scatter you vermin. And rub that meat on the bandages that hold me here. Try it, John. Try it. It may be too late if I move my body a fraction of an inch up. Try it, I tell you. Try it. Look, they... Scatter as soon as I do try. But they are watching you. I can see their eyes glitter. They are creeping back. Can I stand those rats crawling across me? Can the flesh bear it? One of them has leaped on the wooden framework. Another follows. They are gnawing at the bandage. Seven. Eight more sweeps of the pendulum. Does the bandage give way? A little. Lie still. Lie still. Ten. A dozen rats now. Is death, I wonder, worse than this disgust? A dozen sharp knives could do no better. The bandage has loosened to ribbons. It can move sideways, carefully, and drop to the floor. Beatrice, I can't move. 
My arms and legs are numb. There is no power. Oh, you have saved your robe a minute more. It's too late. Try. Then, with all the strength that is in me, and the hatred I bear my enemies, Second time. Three. Dijon, the pendulum stopped. They are drawing it back up through the roof. <laughs> Each move I make is watched. You never doubted that. No. Yet with all they could do to you, they have failed twice. They will not fail a third time, my dear. There must be no more dallying with the King of Terrors. What else can they do? I can't say. See how the rats gnaw in silence with the bandage. To what food, I wonder, have they been accustomed in the pit? To escape the pit? I escaped it once. Listen. What do you hear? Groaning, a grinding as of metal. It was only the cog wheels of the pendulum knife. I think not, Beatrice. Why not? It seemed to come from behind these iron plated walls. It seemed to shake the dungeon as a mill wheel might shake it. it... Stand up, my poor Jean. Get up off your knees. I can't, Beatrice. I can't endure anymore. The paintings on the walls of this dungeon. The skeletons and imps and devils. They seem different. They are different. The colors sharpen and grow bright. The demon eyes glare. The skeleton hands outstretch. Don't you catch even yet the odor of heated iron? Heated iron? I have been much humbled, but I won't have you see me in tears. I order you to go. Join the name of heaven. Yes, in the name of heaven, go. A suffocating heat pervaded the prison. A deeper glow settled in the painted eyes that glared at me. I could draw no breath of air into my lungs against the loom of that fiery destruction. The thought of the pit and its coolness came like balm. I staggered to the edge of the pit. I looked into it. The enkindled walls and roof lighted to it to its depths. Yet for one wild moment, even then, I refused to believe the meaning of what I saw. Does the pit please you, Captain Dalbray? You again? Do you find its contents pleasing? <laughs> Not the pit! Merciful God, anything but the pit! And how shall you avoid it? Look! The dungeon has changed its shape. That is true. The walls are closing in. It was formerly a square, and now it is flattening slowly towards the center to force me into the pit. Of course. It will force you along with me. Again, apparently you must be told, Captain Dalbray, that you are speaking only to your own sick fancy. I am not here at all. Farewell. And now, flatter and flatter grew the red burning walls. With a swiftness that left me no time for thought, I shrank back, but the closing walls pressed me resistlessly onward. At length, for my seared and writhing body, there was no longer any inch of foothold. I tottered on the edge of the pit. <laughs> there was a discordant hum of human voices. There was a loud blast as of many trumpets. The fiery walls rushed back. An outstretched arm caught my own as I fell fainting into the abyss. It was that of General Lassalle. The French army had entered Toledo. 
the Inquisition was in the hands of its enemies. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. So, did an American serial killer's reign of terror reach England? One man believes so. We've been talking about H. H. Holmes this hour, but is it possible that he was the one and only Jack the Ripper? The infamous H. H. Holmes, one of America's earliest and most demented serial killers, he was also the subject of a hugely popular book in 2003. The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson. In fact, Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese are the executive producers of the upcoming series on Hulu based on that book. H. H. Holmes' murder castle included a drugstore on the first floor. A con man as well as a serial killer, he would trick people out of their money and property before taking their lives. Appearing as a normal building, the second floor was complete with disorienting connecting rooms that were designed by Holmes to confuse his victims. Some rooms were made into gas chambers. To dispose of the bodies, there were actual chutes that dropped into the basement, which was filled with acid vats in a crematorium. Interest in H. H. Holmes was recently revived thanks to American Horror Story Hotel. Evan Peters played James March, a character heavily inspired by Holmes. The true identity of Jack the Ripper has long haunted true crime aficionados, the serial killer brutally slit the throats of and disemboweled at least five women in 1888 and may have gone on to kill more. Folklore surrounds the legend of Jack the Ripper, leaving nearly every true crime lover with a different idea about who, exactly, this elusive criminal could have been. In fact, there are now over 100 researched theories, and a relative of Holmes is ready to add another. A recent documentary series was filmed called American Ripper on the History Channel. The series takes a look at evidence uncovered by Holmes' great-great-grandson, Jeff Mudgett, a retired lawyer. Reviews of the show were not great, pointing to the cliché, clunky feel of the show, as well as the conjecture that's presented as evidence. It doesn't seem like Mudgett should be as confident as he is with his hypothesis. In a promo for the show, Mudgett is seen saying, I am a descendant of the devil. I have uncovered credible evidence which suggests that Holmes was Jack the Ripper. This tone is carried through the episode, with Mudgett leaning hard on dramatic declarations. The episode opens on a graveyard, where Mudgett and his collaborator for the series, former CIA operative Amaryllis Fox, are attempting to exhume the corpse of H. H. Holmes from its supposed resting place. There have long been rumors and questions surrounding whether or not Holmes was able to escape his own execution by bribes and a phony corpse. Mudgett and his sister Cynthia 
appear to be proponents of the theory. Mudgett strongly believes that Holmes escaped his execution in Philadelphia and then fled to London where he continued to murder. According to Mudgett, Holmes traded places with another convict and was able to fool all those present for the highly documented public execution. Packed with highly dramatic reenactments, American Ripper shows its hand early, relying on foreboding music to make the story more frightening. A deep voice narrates throughout, a mustachioed actor playing a smirking Holmes in reenactments. We have yet to see any truly notable evidence that these killers were the same man, though. Investigator Amerilis Fox joined forces with Jeff Mudgett on the show to investigate the case by using criminal profiling techniques. She was skeptical of his claims. She said, H.H. H. Holmes is so premeditated that he's built a hotel for the purpose of killing his victims and disposing of their bodies. Jack the Ripper was looking for targets of opportunity and leaving their bodies for anybody to find, so that's one glaring difference between them. These are big claims, sure to grab headlines and attention. This is a problem with the true crime and investigation genre, a tendency towards sensational conspiracy theories that end up hurting the investigation more than helping. Although the families of the victims of these killers are long deceased, there are many other examples of true crime media frenzies where that's not the case. The genre of true crime is growing more and more popular in this time, when we're all craving answers and clear examples of right and wrong in a world settling forever into the gray. It seems likely that we will see more wild connections and more TV shows, documentaries, and podcasts seeking the answers to old questions. For now, answers do not seem likely, but that won't stop television networks from finding ways to capitalize on the unknown. Winter has Louisville in its grip, and former FBI agent Dallas Powell has his hands full with car trouble, cat trouble, and trying to keep the Derby City branch of True Blood Investigations and Security, Inc. solvent. When a juicy insurance job comes his way, he jumps at it, but the discovery of a decades-old murder spawns a veritable blizzard of violence, and Dallas finds himself right in its path. Winter Wonderland a Dallas Powell Mystery by T. Lee Harris, narrated by Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Basil Rathbone inviting you to join me beyond the green door. Today's story is about a man trying to escape the sleepy, drifting death that came from beyond the green door. The snow car skidded, hung for a moment on the lip of a precipice, and then plunged into the depths below. Death struck as suddenly as that, and Philip Bain, thrown miraculously clear, was the only survivor of five men crossing the Yukon in winter. Now he had to walk to Elk City across 200 miles of snow in a temperature of 20 degrees below zero. He knew that he was doomed. He had food, water, matches, and warm clothing. But in all the great white expanse of land, there was no wood for a fire. And without fire, he couldn't stop or camp or rest. No clothing would hold up the razor-edged wind from the Arctic, the freezing wind that lulled a man to sleep while it froze him to death. To stay alive, Bain had to keep on walking, and how long could he walk without sleep? By the third day, Bain could feel the end in sight. He moved on stiff legs, his beard coated with ice crystals, his feet like chunks of lead, his eyelids drooping with the need for sleep. There was nothing he wanted but to lie down and take a little nap, from which he would never awaken. He thought it was an hallucination when he saw a cabin ahead of him, but when he reached it, the door opened. A burly, cheerful man helped him inside, stirred up the fire and put a can of soup on the stove. You're lucky you found this place, the man said. My name's Jim, and you can't imagine how glad I am to see another human face. I've prospected alone here ever since my partner Shorty died. Bain pushed away filmy cobwebs of sleep and asked how Shorty had died. 
Well, Jim said, I got angry one day and I killed him. He wouldn't believe I'd seen goblins from Mars. And he laughed when I told him about the underground machine that's always watching me. He didn't believe me, so I killed him. But uh, you believe me, don't you? Bain could see that the man was insane and a killer. Warned by Shorty's fate, he quickly nodded his agreement. I'm glad, Jim said, because otherwise I'd have to do terrible things to you like I did to Shorty. But since you believe me, it's all right. I'll tell you all about the Martian goblins and the underground machine, and in the spring you can go to Elk City and tell the people the truth. I'll do that, Bain said. He would have to live an entire winter with this madman. And if he watched himself, well, he'd come out alive. Black waves of sleep were washing over him, but he forced his eyes open and heard Jim say, I'm going to explain about the goblins right now, so pay attention and don't go acting like Eddie Bird. Oh, who, who, who was he, Bane asked, driving his nails into his hand to stay awake. He was my partner before Shorty, Jim said. He said he believed me, and then, while I was explaining, he fell asleep. Now, that wasn't right, was it? I, I guess not, Bain said. It was too bad, Jim said thoughtfully, but I can't stand people who go to sleep while I'm talking. Outside, the snow was falling. Inside, Jim began to tell about the goblins from Mars. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please, share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness, aside from the old-time radio shows, are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.